Hi, I'm Freeway Frank, and welcome to the Drive-By Podcast. So excited to be teaming up with one of my favorite brands, Dorme Vu. I worked with this brand for close to a decade on the radio, and now that I've made the transition here as a podcaster on the Real Drive-By Podcast, they have followed me here and lent their support, and I couldn't be more thrilled. Find out about the Dorme Vu New Year, New You event, which is on now later on during this podcast. Meanwhile, Enjoy it, and thank you so much once again to Dormevo. This is the Drive By with Freeway Frank. Vince Guzzo is at my house. Vince, you made it here. It's a beautiful house, by the way. Thank you. You're not just saying that. No, no, no. It's a beautiful house. Because I know you have a gorgeous several homes in the United States and here in Canada, but thank you. And in Europe. And in Europe. In the hometown, you know. Yeah. You got to connect, connect to my dad's roots. Yeah, you got to put the Guzzo mm. stamp everywhere around the world, anywhere you can, and anywhere you could see it. Just like you live, for the people who don't know, you live just outside of Montreal in Terrebonne, yep. and you told me that you bought that property so you could see your name in lights from the movie theater. True? That's right. Yeah. I could actually, from my backyard during the winter, yeah. I see the theater. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Not when the leaves are around. No, yeah, when the leaves are around, I don't see anything. Even though I try and cut some of those trees, but then the city gets mad at me, so I just, I let them be now. Even though for every tree I cut, I planted 10. Yeah. (laughs) So, not so bad. Vince, from the bottom of my heart, honestly, it means a lot that you're here today, that you made the trek to come to uh, the Real Drive-By Podcast, so I really appreciate it. Uh, Wanted to mention, because Vince walked in, he didn't walk with his wet snow boots around my house. Being Italian, we know. So he he bought a pair of brand new shoes, which he's debuting on the Real Drive-By Podcast. Check these out. Are you going to hand them to me? or? I'll give them to you. Okay, so here are the shoes. And the right shoe has a screw on it, and the other one has COVID. And I, I got to say, you're, you don't have sweaty feet because they're not, um, yeah, they're in good shape, these shoes. Because there's nothing to sweat about. Nothing to nothing sweat. To you're sweat a really about. calm, cool, and collected guy. Um, as, as my dad once said to me when he <laughs> heard me scream <laughs> at, uh, at a movie distributor, he came in and he said to me, he goes, what are you, crazy? Like, I mean, you're going to die of a heart attack. But for what? Because, man, you scream like that. You got all mad. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I relieved it. He's now not going to sleep tonight right. wondering, oh, my God, like, I just got beaten up by Guzzo on the phone. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, me, I, I, I relieved the stress. Vince, uh, the reason why I wanted you to come on the podcast and the reason why I started this drive-by <laughs> podcast is so that, you know, my guests could come over. We could have a, a drink at my bar, which you which we just had a little yeah. drink, uh, but you, no alcohol for you, um, at. And then we could move the conversation in here into the main studio and be real and raw and talk about um, you know getting to know you and finding out who the real uh, Vince Guzzo is, what ticks you off. But now there, there's just too much shit happening here in Canada and in our home province of Quebec. So we need to cut, you know, cut to the chase and get right to it. So what the heck is happening to our province with all these restrictions and continued draconian um, lockdowns? Look, it's lunacy, it's amateurism, it's even if I wanted to help them, I, I don't even think they have, some of the people there are so convinced in their ways that I don't think their IQ level is high enough for them to even understand why businesses should all be open, why if you want to help hospitals, it's not closing businesses down. Um, and, and, you know, the contradictions we're all seeing, you know, if you look at the behavior and, and everybody's saying, but why are they so contradictory? Is, you know, I always like to say, if you don't want to remember anything, just say the truth all the time. The minute you start lying, now you're stumbling on your things, right? So I want you to go back, not to the last press conference, the one that was before Christmas, where um, I think it was on the 20th, or or, yeah, something like that. On the 20th, Dubé shut down theaters, gyms, and whatever. And then on the Thursday or on the Wednesday, Legault booked another 6 o'clock press conference. I, 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 I don't know if everybody realized that when he said... To one of his staffers, can you take that that TV that's 
running messages across that's distracting me? That's called a teleprompter. <laughs> so that's what politicians use to read their speech and look at you so that they look honest and you could look at them in the eyes and it looks like they're being honest to you. So he actually told his staff to remove the teleprompter. And if you look at Dubé's expression, it's clear that that message was Dubé's message that had to be read out by the premier. And so then he read his own. Now, you know, what did he do? 25 to 10, 10 to 6, no bubbles, bubbles. I, I, I was confused. Um, you're saying, so by, by saying what you're saying now is this wasn't Dubé's decision. This was Francois Legault who decided to put us in this lockdown again, or he was, you know, setting up the pieces, putting them all together so that we would head there eventually, which is where we are now, once again, in a <coughs> 10 to 5 o'clock curfew. You're saying this is not the way it was supposed to be. This was not the advice that he may have gotten from Aruda and Dubé. So what I'm telling you as a fact is that Dubé is a less of a politician than uh, Legault is. Legault basically made the decision at the last minute not to do the lockdown for Christmas because the polls were saying you will get destroyed. People will you know, go crazy. They're still going to get together for Christmas. It won't give you anything. Um, Aruda, he's as much as he's a complacent wit uh, 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 um, hostage, as I like to call it, <laughs> he, he he's a bit of a victim of his own uh, of his own doing, right? In the sense that he, he wanted to be funny, you know, with the songs, washing his hands, and everything, and it was all cute, cute. But the problem is that as the mental health issues started kicking in, it was no longer cute. The problem is. We all have to go back to December 2020 when he was in front of the National Assembly and he was asked point blank, did you ask for the closure of restaurants? And he says, no. Yet, we had a, a premier who on the 28th of September of the same year said, it's not me, it's public health. Right. They're imposing the closure of cinemas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, whether the government likes it or not, it is impossible to avoid leaks in a government. Mm -hmm. I have copies of the recommendations, and theaters were not supposed to be closed. So the closure of movie theaters in October of 2020 was a political decision. And I, I make fun of Legault often on this one, uh, and I use my father as the comparison when I say, when my father goes on a construction site or he walks into one of my movie theaters, he doesn't tell anybody, hey, 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 I'm the boss. Same way the boss. He doesn't say that. He, just he walks in and they know yeah. just by his demeanor, just by his sa prestance, is, it, this is the boss. Like This is the guy that's the real boss above everything else here. So the fact that we have a premier who insisted on going on CTV to tell a journalist, but ultimately I'm the one who got elected and I'm the boss. Well, let's get something clear. You got elected as an MA. It's your party that then chose you as the MA to be leader of the party, which mm -hmm. then made you premier. People didn't vote for you as the ultimate leader. Mm -hmm. So let's get that clear, first of all. Second of all, if you are the boss, well, then take your responsibilities. You have the worst record of any province in Quebec, oh, sorry, any province in Canada yeah. for wave one and two. You corrected yourself on wave three, and now you have the worst record again for wave four. And it doesn't matter. It, you know, people need to understand. So, you know, a lot of people don't realize this. Um, I actually graduated from university with two degrees, right? So just <laughs> let's get that clear. As much as you want to make fun of my accent, no accent. I mean, so I have an economics degree. Do people make fun of your accent? Well, I mean, you know, bye-bye. I mean, I don't mind, you know, like... Uh, <laughs> well, for, for people that are outside Quebec, bye-bye is a parody show that they do on New Year's every year here in Quebec where they make fun of pretty much everybody. Yeah, Quebec the whole culture. year in retrospective, yeah. but in a, in a, in a caricature so, kind of thing, right? And they always seem to go after your... Yeah, that's your fine. Accent. I have no... I actually... Yeah. I don't mind it. It actually tells me... <laughs> You know, it actually tells me that, hey, you know what? What I had to say or what I did was significant enough to be brought up at this thing. The, only thing, that, the only thing that bothers me every time is like, I never realized I had such a heavy Italian accent or <laughs> foreign accent, as they like to call it. Um, 
uh, when I speak French, even though I went to a school like Brebeuf. So, you know, I guess I'm going to have to ask for a refund for my tuition because they didn't, they didn't erase the accent or something. They didn't do a good job there. But <laughs> so I have a, so I have an economics degree from Western and, and I, and I, uh, and I have a specialty in statistics. So, you know, people need to understand. I don't, I don't have to stand up. I don't have to scream at the government. I don't have to do anything. I mean, I could get in my car, cross the U.S. border, and spend four months in Florida or in New York State, whatever, and wait for this craziness to pass. But for the first three waves, I did not move. So I came back on March 14th, 2020, quarantined for two weeks, spoke to the government on a regular basis, telling them, you guys are insane. In other words, on the 13th, they confirmed to me theaters will not be closed. Trust me, we can't afford to close theaters. And by afford, people need to remember, movie theaters are a staple of stability for the communities mm -hmm. they're in. So people, it's the reference point. It's like churches used to be 100 years ago, while well, movie theaters are that. So you'll notice in the U.S., movie theaters are very rarely closed or forced to close. In fact, we operate 365 days a year. Uh, we always did, even when on Sundays business had to be closed, movie theaters could operate, right? Uh, Christmas Day, we operate. The New Year's Day, we operate. The 2nd of January, everything's closed. The whole world's closed. I know because all of my employees would bring their mother's leftover food from the 1st so that we could eat because no restaurants were open. But we were allowed to be open. That's mm -hmm. how important they were. So you realize that it started off a very strenuous relationship when I'm told movie theaters will not be shut. I'm now listening to a press conference on the Sunday, the 15th. My theaters are operating. They're open. People are in the, audit in the auditorium. And I have a prime minister, a premier, that says to me, theaters will not be shut at 10 o'clock. And then at 1 o'clock, he announces the closure of movie theaters. It's like, what, is it a joke or what? What, what the hell happened in, in you know, three hours? Then I did not move from Canada, except for going to, well, from, I didn't move from Montreal, but except for going to Toronto for filming of Dragons then mm -hmm. that September. So I only went to the US in July, end of July, 2021. Basically, you're committed to your home province, home city. You didn't abandon ship. That's right. I, I stayed here. I said, I want my employees to know that we're going to continue paying them. Mm -hmm. We're going to do all kinds of stuff, repairs, maintenance, whatever, in the theaters. This is not going to last more than three months. Four months, then five months, then we reopen. But we reopen always with that threat. See, and, and, and this is what people need to understand. It's worse to open up a business and threaten people to go to the business than might as well just shut us down then. Because at least we're going to save hydro costs. We're going to save all kinds of costs. But if you open me up and then you're trying to make going to the movies a sin, well, what the hell? Just keep us closed. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that people need to understand that as business leaders, we need to communicate with public health. Why? Because public health are expert in one thing. Health. Mm -hmm. That's about it. So they're they're in contact with you. You have regular phone calls with them. We have regular phone calls. We have what they call in uh, person uh, at Citre, right? Who is an expert and who we've coached and trained and explained to how a movie theater works. In other words, I've had people from public health come to my theaters, put machinery in my auditoriums. We operated the ventilation systems. We uh, 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 infected the room at a certain point with non-COVID uh, uh, um, bacteria and we saw how long it took for that bacteria to leave the room. We then tested uh, what they call um, uh, uh, electrostatic cannons to disinfect across, and no wiping down. You just you know, blow up the whole room mm -hmm. full of smoke and within five minutes everything's 100% clean. So we did all of this to show and at a certain point, somebody at Public Health said to me, you know, thanks for all the data, but, but we know this already. In other words, we know that movie theaters have better ventilation systems than hospitals. 
which is pretty sick if you think about it. I mean, you know, it's they're, private money. They're admitting that. <laughs> yeah, well, they're admitting it, right? And, and schools don't even have air conditioning, some of them, right? So, you, so have you ever noticed, I always tell people, you know, people, my dad always says to me, he goes, you know, when your uncle's in the hospital, you should go say, say hi to him, and, you know, go see him. God, when he gets out, I'll go see him at the house. He goes, but why? You know, go to us. Listen to me. Every time I go to the hospital, <laughs> I start scratching myself. It's as if I'm getting sick or something. There's something wrong. And you know that the, the air is heavy, and it's sort of like, you know, it's like a lot of too many sick people in the same place. I, I don't want to be there. Type of thing, and not because I'm a hypochondriac or anything. I just and not all hospitals feel that way. They seem to feel that way here in Quebec. But if I've been to a lot of hospitals in other parts of the world, where you walk in and you can't believe you think you're at a mall. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The oh, ventilation yeah, yeah. is great. So no, you're. Uh, I went. Uh, 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 right. My third son, uh, when he was very young, was playing with a car on a treadmill, and the car, and the car fell, and he tried to get in. The treadmill burnt. You know, the inside of part of his hand that got stuck. You know, it's sort of like sandpaper type of thing. And I went to Southampton. Uh, hospital. So for the people who watch Royal Pains, <laughs> hey, let me tell you. Let me tell you. For a hospital that is a private hospital that is servicing only about 200,000, 300,000 people, it's spectacular. It's it's like it's the equivalent of uh, a casino in Vegas versus a casino in some remote uh, place in Montana. Mm -hmm. That's how impressive it was. But so the guys at Public has told us, they said, look, we know all of this. The problem is we have a premier that doesn't feel he can explain to people why 10 people in your house is dangerous, but 200 in a the movie theater isn't. So what do you mean? What can't he explain? I mean, it's mathematical, right? An, an average auditorium is 5,000 square feet. You're sitting down. You're not moving from one room to the other. You're like mm -hmm. there. You're watching. You're you're supposed to be quiet, and you're supposed to be watching a movie. And it's massive room, though. And it's massive room, yeah. and it's got 27, uh, you know, ceilings. sometimes uh, even higher foot ceilings, yeah. which means that the the hot air coming out of your mouth, which shouldn't be coming out of your mouth if you're not talking, but anyway, it comes out because you're breathing anyway, <laughs> will rise. Shouldn't be talking in a movie right? theater because it rises because <laughs> hot air rises, rises and cold air drops. So yeah. it's so, and so she says, but he just can't explain it. Right, and that's where the problem is. And, and, and so if anybody's seen tweets lately uh, against the Minister of Culture, it's because she is not a defender of the industry. What she's basically doing is just abiding by what her boss wants, comes back to us and feeds us uh, a load of uh, malarkey, and then she expects me to just say, oh, okay, yeah, I'm gonna accept what you have to say. So yeah. Natalie Roy is the uh, Minister of Culture and Communications here in Quebec. You were tagging her on Twitter, writing some stuff, to, you know, about- But nothing your, about her. Nothing about her personally, things about the pandemic, your situation, the situation that our citizens are in here in Quebec, all legitimate arguments. But in 2022 now, you know, Vince, you're not allowed to say anything anymore because the minute you say something they don't like, they turn you off. And literally, she blocked you on Twitter. Oh, she did worse than that, right? The blocking is the public uh, uh, spectacle. Which, which offended you, right. obviously. It, it because you're, it's just, for me, it's childish. It's like, what kind of a kid... You know, it's like, what are we in who the schoolyard? Right? Yeah, yeah. Like, it, you know what? It brought but me back. it's insulting for somebody who owns 18 movie theaters and, and contributes to the, the business of Quebec, the economy of Quebec, for her to do that. To right. So, so in a non, uh, uh, I don't want to throw myself too many flowers, but. I'll throw them at you. So we're the third largest movie theater operator in Canada. Amazing. We're the largest Quebec-owned operator in Quebec. Mm -hmm. Um. And in, in, a, and in a tweet, I, list, I, I, I tagged all of the movie studios in the U.S. and all of the movie studios and distributors in Quebec. And I said to the person who said, what the hell have you ever done for Quebec cinema culture? He says, why don't you ask them directly? It's like, I don't even want to waste my time explaining to you what I've done. Like, people don't realize that if Quebec movies are shown in the amount of screens that they are, we started that in 1998 when we opened up our first three megaplexes and we played Les Boys in 45 screens, which were 50% of our auditorium, mm -hmm. right? So as much as we've created controversy about what I said about French Canadian movies, which was, once again, it doesn't matter what I like. 
You know, you know what people don't understand is when I say to people these kind of movies, you know, basically a, a, a person who's become a friend now, a journalist from Journal de Montréal calls me up and asks me in 2000 and uh, I think it was 10 or 11 or 12 or something. He says to me, why do you think Quebec market share went from 21% to 3%? He said to him, he says, well, if we would just stop making whining movies about every, you know, like the, I, the word I used was they film lamentage, which was always complaining about God knows what. Maybe people would want to come and see the movies, right? <laughs> so now, obviously, that touches the artistic community who felt very... Pissed, offended, yeah. uh, offended at that and they came after me whatever and one of the guys that uh, became famous over it was um, Xavier Delan who said uh, I think uh, Tout le monde en parle said va chier what's funny is the second visit on Tout le monde en parle he rectified his va chier to I really respect Mr. Guzzo but. because he realized that the movie that he released right after he told me to go chier I didn't play it and he saw the box office number was no longer was worse than it would, would have normally been Mm -hmm. Which means, if I don't play the movies, I can hurt your movie. Mm -hmm. So I have no interest in hurting Quebec movies. On the contrary, it's my province. It's where I I, I was born. I grew up here. Uh, you know, so I, I, I don't I don't uh, I don't want to hurt Quebec movies. Second of all, American movies cost more in royalties than Quebec movies. If I can make a million dollars off a Quebec movie versus a, an American movie, I'm, more money stays in my pocket. Mm -hmm. So I have every interest. And so my comment was to say, we should make movies that people want to see, like we did in 2005 with La Grande Seduction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The joke was, I think uh, a year later or something, uh, I was invited to Tout le monde en parle, and you know, For uh, people who don't know in other parts of uh, Canada, Tout le monde en parle is a big show, Quebec the show. The number one. The number one talk show on television in Quebec yeah. where the most interesting personalities go on. And um, yeah, you've been like on two it. Million, two million people viewers, uh, yeah. minimum yeah. every Sunday. Right. It's massive. It's a massive. It's massive. And so, I don't know, maybe they thought, you know, they were going to, we had just come out of the... Uh, of the Charbonneau Commission, so I think they thought, hey, you know, good son time guy, he's gonna, he's like those, uh, some of those guys who dig the holes over there, so hey, we're gonna have fun with him, right? So when I went there, I just, you know, he, what I think they didn't count on was on the fact that, you know, I have an economics degree, I have a law degree, and I've been in the business for 40 years. So at that point, I think I know what I'm talking about. So, you know, I tried to explain to them, I said, look, I'm not talking about me, I don't care. I really don't care. I mean, if I like the movie, I'll watch it. If I don't like it, I stop watching. I, I don't pay. Right? I, let's get something. I do not pay to watch movies. <laughs> it's free for me. So it doesn't bother me. But it does bother French Canadians who feel ripped off mm -hmm. when they're going to see these depressive movies. So I was talking on behalf of the people. And it was funny because while Gia and Danny were trying to be comedians, people were actually clapping at the comments that I was saying, which was, but make Movies that these guys want to pay for, or else the money's going to the U.S. anyway, right? Mm -hmm. And so, this whole thing that Quebec sometimes, or a small segment, a very left, left, but very left wing uh, segment of the Quebec population, who like to call themselves Quebec intellectuals, which I'd like to see a degree <laughs> to prove that, that makes them intellectual in anything. Um, believe that as a son of an Italian immigrant, call me an allophone, call me whatever the hell you want, I, I, I'm not allowed to talk about French culture. So if I can't talk and criticize French culture, then what should I be complaining about? Because I'm not an important player in the Quebec cultural industry, right? So that's why now some of these weirdos came out of the woodwork. Uh, it's funny because one of the Twitter... Haters uh, is a woman called Falardo, which is the same last name as Pierre Falardo, who created the ever famous um, Elvis Graton, which is a parody um, of basically think big as T, you know, like the, the American way, you know, if we were more American, right? And then basically makes them make El Elvis Graton is a bit like trailer trash, mm -hmm. you know, kind of a parody of a redneck American and so forth and so forth. Um, <laughs> What's interesting, though, is that when Pierre Falardeau was asked, like, why do you make movies like that? Like, you know, you, you, 
you know, like you made 18 something. I forget, it was another movie about, uh, you know, one of the historic moments in, in Quebec culture. Why would you make like a parody like that or whatever? He looked and he said to them in French, he said, Mais là, Chris, faut bien que je mange moi aussi. You know, even me, I gotta eat. In other words, I gotta make money somewhere because those other movies, they don't money. make money. But this, this one's making money, right? And so this lady, you know, said that I'm to, to French culture what a mustard pogo is to gastronomy, right? So <laughs> because her last name was Falardo, I said, you know what, I'm gonna use it. And I said, you know, like Pierre Falardeau and uh, and Elvis Graton, right? And uh, you would know about the you know mustard pogo because you have it for dinner. I don't. I, right. I don't never type of thing, right? <laughs> and I tried to tell her what is it that's bothering you is that I'm the son of an immigrant and that I've done more for the Quebec movie industry than you have, except for maybe buy a movie ticket because I've never paid for a movie ticket. Mm -hmm. So you know, and, and so she then oh no, no, you know became very defensive the same way. Our premier was no, no. There's no systematic, uh, uh, ra uh, no systemic uh, 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 racism, racism in Quebec. No, not at all. Good so sell your movie theaters and open yourself a, uh, a tomato sauce company called Gattuso, right? You, you know, so you know those repeated stupid comments. Okay, which we hear a lot. Which we hear a we lot. We have heard a lot. That's right. Over the d decades and and over the years, the words that come to mind all the time is one day my father was in Italy in our hometown and somebody said to him, hey, there's the American. Because, you know, uh, for Southern Italians, Canada, the US, Mexico, it's America. Yep. It doesn't matter. <laughs> even, even Argentina, it's America, right? <laughs> so my father started laughing and he said to him, he says, you know, one day, one day, I'm going to pay enough taxes somewhere that that country is going to adopt me. And he goes, what do you mean? I don't know, why do you call me an American for? I spent 21 years of my life in this, in this town. And then I had to immigrate because I had to make a living. And, and I want you to realize that I had to immigrate to make a living. Which means that for all of those French Canadians who think that immigrants come to Quebec because the French culture is beautiful, you know that their culture, the Italian culture, the English culture, the Lebanese culture, the, all of the other cultures, they're beautiful too. To the point that we go be tourists in those countries to experience their culture. Mm -hmm. When my father came here, he didn't come to experience the culture. He came, came here, here to, to make work. a living. Yeah. To make a living and to do work that they couldn't find Quebecers to do. So you can imagine, it wasn't the nicest jobs in the world no. that were being offered. And so the whole idea comes down to this. And I say it often. Uh, you know, I said it to uh, Jacques Parizeau. And, uh, and the former and, premier of Quebec. And, and, and we'll, uh, we'll also announce something special about Jacques Parizeau uh, today. Uh, Who said, by the way, back in the 90s that they, uh, they lost the, the referendum to the uh, immigrant vote. Right? No, worse than that. He said, on a perdu parce que de l'argent et des immigrants. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because of money and immigrants. Right? I was so, actually being more diplomatic by right. saying it my way, but uh, yeah, it was worse than that. Yeah. Now, the joke is, I knew <laughs> Jacques Parizeau before that, right. before he said that, and I remember telling Jacques Parizeau how much, I said to him, combien d'argent, how much money do I have to pay in taxes, and how long do I have to live here for you to stop saying Mais toi, t'es Italien. You, you're Italian. Like, like, when is it that as a born in Montreal person that I become a Quebecer? I've never lived anywhere else except for three years when I lived in London, Ontario to study. Okay. I was just so, about to mention, Vince, anywhere else in Canada, nobody gives a shit. But here in Quebec, they have to remind you every day that, that you're, not, you're technically, you know what it is, you're not one of us, by the way. That's right. You're that's, Italian. That's right. It's the, it's the subtle. It's horrible. It's the subtle, right? And so... I force my kids to watch some of their favorite movies in French, just because I want to be a torturing father. And I say, no, <laughs> I want you to, I want you to learn and understand the French language. I want you to, and so I want people to know that I know who Saint Florian is. 
I know who what TVI is. I know that uh, that uh, uh, um, Desev used to be the original owner of TV. You know, like 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 you know I the know the history, history. Yeah. all of the history of Christ, because I grew up here in the East End of Montreal in the Hochelaga district where my father played only French movies. So, so I I connect with the French people. I have no problem. So why they? Why there's a bunch of intellectual haters who want to deviate the subject. And the subject was, why the hell would a, an elected official who's being paid with my tax dollars block me when I didn't even say anything about you? Mm -hmm. I, didn't even, after my, I didn't even criticize her. I was criticizing her boss because I knew that she's nothing else but a tool. She, she, she decides nothing. She gets up in the morning and maybe decides what she's going to wear as clothes. Apart from that, she doesn't decide anything else. So, like, what am I going to pick on her for? But you block me. Like, what the hell do you think you are? And that brought me, what got me angry wasn't her block. It was that I called her a liar once. So if you'll remember well, in February of 2021, theaters, so... Mr. Legault used to find it funny. I guess he gave him credibility when he said, I spoke to Mr. Guzzo and uh, he explained to me uh, they need uh, three weeks uh, to open uh, before the theaters. Uh, I understand. I, I listen. I listen. <laughs> and the problem is I told him four things. He only reported one. Uh, the other three <laughs> totally forgot them. And that was the problem is that he, 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 and it's very symbolic. That press conference is very symbolic of why we're in the shit that we're in today. It's because when I tell you the three important or four important things for theaters to reopen, you can't pick and choose. They're all linked. They're all connected. So, I, I know, I give you three weeks, no problem. We had spoken to public health. We knew what are the conditions to reopen. This, 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 this. Perfect. Popcorn, n not even on the table. It, it wasn't even discussed. When we got the paper... Popcorn wasn't on it. <laughs> it wasn't. But you know what happened? This is what happened. Some girl who's on the, I guess, on the board or something of Investment Quebec, who's also VP of some restaurant association, said, guys, you're killing me. You're like literally killing me. And, and I know this because the journalist who announced to me that popcorn wasn't permitted, it was live. I was, man, I me, right? it's, it, it became like one of those TikTok videos. Type of thing. He only found out after the press conference finished, 10, 15 minutes after, which was five minutes before he was interviewing me. And basically, what he said is, look, it's very simple. She called and said, you're killing me. The restaurants can't have dining rooms, but you can eat a popcorn in a movie theater. But... Guys, do you realize there's a difference between eating popcorn and, hit, and, and being at 48 inches from the person in front of you at 50% capacity and it's the back of the person's head that's in front of you, right? Versus being in a restaurant at 22 inches, 25 inches different, facing each other, talking, eating, laughing, drinking, and everything. It, two different risk factors with saliva, with air. with. So what the hell are you talking about, no popcorn? It's crazy. And Popcorn Gate was born. Yes. In February of 2021. 21. Yeah. Right? And it made That's us... how long... I have to think back. That's no, how no, long this just, silliness has been going that's on. That's right. And it made the French-European media, where some journalists said, hey, that Mr. Guzzo guy, he's tough, man, because even after they offered to pay, compensate him for the popcorn, he said, stick it up yours. I want to open my theaters without any subsidies. Right? And that's where people need to understand. We have to stop. We have to stop being left-wing political advocates. Meaning what? We have to stop use these one-liner cool slogans as if they mean everything, and we don't even know what the hell they mean, right? So, when somebody says we need to protect our hospitals, we need to help our hospitals, we need to. Okay, so tell me something. If you're so concerned about our hospitals, right? Why is it that in August 2021, you threatened the whole medical profession with you either get vaccinated or we're firing you? 
Like seriously, it like, mattered like, so much. Yeah. Like 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 let's That's sit down. That's how he treated the right. frontline workers. That's right. So so let's just and and I want I want that to sink in. I want everybody mm. to realize the most important person for us are those people. They're the ones who are going to take care of us and are going to prevent further debts. And we're threatening them. Wow. It's a hell of a lot of appreciation from this government, right? Then those people played the bluff. And then they got an extension of a month on the threat. And then in September, after they started realizing they were going to lose the fight, Dr. Dubé, oh, no, no, accountant to Dubé, sorry, I was going to call him a doctor because he's a you know, health minister. I thought he was a doctor all of a sudden. Uh, uh, <laughs> says, we need to get, we need to start realizing that we need to, we're going to have to get used to living with this virus. If you go on my Twitter account, September 2021, you will see that I take his comment and I match it to similar comments I made literally a year earlier. I said, look, buddy, it's clear. Unfortunately, when you become somewhat of a public celebrity or a public you know, person, a lot of people want to talk to you because they want contributions for their researchers. So the WHO has no problem sharing information with me, which is in May of 2020, they had already started saying, stop the, stop the lockdowns. The lockdowns aren't helping. No. You're increasing mental health issues. You're creating economic dependency on governments. And we're going to have to get used to, to live with this. So it took us a year and three months to say it to our people. And then what did we do again? Oh, oh yeah, it's true. Then in, oh, oh, yeah, in December... We had great news. 25 people for Christmas. Amazing. I love it. <laughs> Rock and roll. <laughs> Life's beautiful. Right? And then, oh, wait, wait, wait. was it a week and a half later? No, no, no. You guys have been bad boys. Drop you down to 10 people. 50% capacity in movie theater. So let me tell you something. I opened a movie theater on the 17th of December. To that moron, and I'm going to call him a moron. So that moron who actually called into a radio station and said, not the brightest guy in the world, huh? Who the hell opens a movie theater in the middle of a pandemic? Too bad he was of my Italian background. One of us. One of us, huh? Well, first of all, that theater started construction in 2019. And it took this long because of this pandemic and we didn't know. And so forth. Then before we opened it, guess what we did? We actually picked up the phone, which you can't do. But I could. Picked up the phone, called public health, and said, okay, guys, I stopped the fucking around here. What's going on? Are we going to reshut down? Ta -ta Mr. Gutzler, listen to me. These were the words from public health. Mr. Gutzler, listen to me. We didn't want to shut you down last year at this time. And it was a bloodbath. Why would we shut you down now? So I opened the movie theater. Mm -hmm. To be shut down three days later, by the way. Right, but it's not it's not m Mr. Legault. It's public health. You'll notice he doesn't say Arruda anymore. He says public health because now, don't blame him. It's one of his cronies. Uh, one of his cronies. But, but him, he can't go out and say I'm the boss. <laughs> right here, he's the boss. So he could, and that's where we need to understand. They don't know what they're doing now. March. 2020, you don't know what you're doing. Look, you know we were what? all scared. No let, one had well, any. Clue. Let, me, let me tell you like no this. No one knew what was yeah, going on. Nobody knew. No, but nobody knew the severity of what was going on. Correct. But let's sometimes, you know, and uh, I also have a law degree from Lucam, which happens to be a French, French university. French university. Uh, <laughs> somehow my French accent is my time. I'm still there after. Four years there. It took me four years to do my law degree, right? You and speak so, French very well, by the way. Well, no, but I mean, you know, it's just... Uh, and so, so uh, the problem was that a lot of people don't realize that in law, we say what you say is important. But what you do is even more telling of what the intention was versus the BS of your words. Mm -hmm. So I was supposed to go for spring break to London and Paris 
on a rugby tour with my son's high school and 30 other kids and parents and so forth and so forth. I was supposed to then come back and start the race for the leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada. I canceled my trip. I canceled my trip, rebooked my trip to East Hampton. I announced to the Conservative Party that I would be not putting in, even though I had all the signatures, I gave them to them. See, here's the signatures, everything, just to prove to you guys, not that I didn't have the support. Here's everything, but I'm walking away. I can't. And I decided to support Aaron O'Toole. That means that somebody knew something that if I knew about it, I'm assuming the powers that be that are called the governments knew that something was coming. Something was coming up. How bad was it going to be? We don't know. But this is what's funny. When my first contacts with the crisis team occurred in March 2020, the 15, 16, 17, 18, the question I had was I said to them, you can't shut movie theaters down. You're going to lose control of your teenagers. You've closed the schools. It's going to be a mess. You can't, you cannot shut the movie like you gotta give these kids something to do they're all gonna group into their basements and they're all gonna do crazy things and it's gonna be worse ah shut up what do you know okay no problem three days later Legault goes on on national tv and he says you the parents are the responsible ones you need to put your foot down and tell kids no inviting their friends over so everything i had told them three days before was happening and at that point i said by the way out of curiosity you guys have a psychologist or a psychiatrist on the team what do you mean it's a pandemic okay so you guys don't see anything wrong with shutting down borders you don't see the panic in people saying, what do you mean you're shutting down borders? What do you mean I can't travel? What do you mean you're limiting my mobility? What do you mean you're locking me down in my house? You don't see anything wrong with that in the minds of people. Well, not, no. Why don't you guys start calling up a few shrinks, my friend, because you're going to need a lot of them to advise you in the next few months. Once again, I thought it was going to be three months. I didn't think the stupidity would still be going, would on. Still be going on, right? So... The problem is that. The problem is that the behavior, right, that is occurring is very simple. We in Quebec made a very big strategic mistake. We assumed that the virus was going to attack on the elderly more vulnerable. Okay? So why did we take all the nurses away from the senior citizen homes and move them to, to the hospitals? In other words, why is it that a 93, and I, and I apologize to the family, I don't know the name and I don't want to know the name, but I apologize to the family if anybody sees the connection here. Why did a 93-year-old woman with advanced medical conditions, why was she left alone in a senior citizen home for three days without any diaper change or anything? I mean, I, I apologize. I mean, people need to understand this is how people die on a regular basis. In, in other words, what I'm trying to say is nobody dies of cancer. You have to understand. Cancer weakens your immune system to the point that you can't fight off the common cold. Mm -hmm. And the common cold will kill you, right? So, so, so we knew that these people, and, and we let them die. Yep. And, and, and what Premier Legault needs to remember, we were the first society, first group, first community to insist on passing a law to an individual's right to die with dignity. And the first thing we did is we removed to 10,000 of our elders the right to die in dignity with their families and with the appropriate help that they had paid for. Mm -hmm. These were all paid for. Whether they paid directly to a private uh, a senior citizen home or they paid through their taxes over the years, right? Because remember, Premier Legault, six months after that, said to the teenagers, you owe it to your elders for what they've sacrificed to create the Quebec we have today, to not contaminate them. Yeah, and, and you didn't owe them to take care of them the first way? So, believe it or not, when Minister McCann stepped down, 
or was told to step down. It was a sad day because we lost all humanity in the Minister of Health. What we got is the only person who was willing to take the job under the condition that he be the boss. Which means, even though Legault went out and said, I'm the boss, he's really not the boss. Mm -hmm. Because Dubai can step down anytime he wants. He either do it my way or I'm leaving. And, and it's always beautiful when an employee threatens you that way. And normally, it doesn't fly too well with me. It's like, by the way, you know the door you came in by? Turn, take it right away because you're not threatening me. Right? I mean, we're, we're going to sit down, have yeah. a dialogue, but you're not threatening me. Mm -hmm. And so, ultimately, we have not learned anything from wave one, two, three. We're back to square one. Worse. Worse than Worse. Yeah. We're still trying to convince us that the only way to help our hospitals is by shutting the whole world down around them. But what have they done to nothing. make things better in healthcare? Nothing, nothing. In fact, somebody said to me when I denounced the incompetency of the government decisions during wave one, they said, what, what, what would you have done? It's very simple. The first thing I would have done is I would have bought my own vaccines. I don't have to wait for Trudeau to give me the money. It, it, what is it, a begging fest? Oh, please, please, can you give me the money? Can you give me my vaccines? Well, I can't go buy them. Saskatchewan bought their own vaccines. Manitoba. Manitoba bought their own vaccines. And then they sent the bill to Trudeau, which we could have done the same. So in other words, you know, this pandemic, wave one and two, were a great example. Could have been, sorry, I should say. Could have been a great example of... Souveraineté Association, right? Of uh, a free Quebec, uh, our own country. Look at how great we would. If anything, this pandemic has proven to us, Quebec needs Canada more than Canada needs Quebec, my friend. Let me tell you. Because but not according to what Legault says, because well, he reminds us at every press conference how much better Quebec is doing than the rest of Canada and the world. I yeah. mean, he always has to put that in there. It's almost like an insecurity that he has, that he has to keep reminding the public, we're doing this right. But well, no, no, but it's not an insecurity. It's an amazing Trump-like marketing political campaign. The more I repeat. He's pandering for votes. Yeah, he's just saying, if he says it, he knows that there's going to be people who don't know how to dissect the data and will say, well, All hey, right. the premier said, oh, what the fuck, you can't, they can't be lying to me. Yo, bro, you know who I am. You know, like, like they, just, they don't get it. So there's a lot of votes of people who, you know, Quebec is a very different, we are a distinct society, a very distinct society. What happened in Quebec during wave one, two, and three, had that happened in the rest of Canada, there would have been premiers already deposed from their, from their job. I mean, it would have been a revolution already because the Anglos will not take this as easily. Now, the problem that we have in Quebec is a lot of our Anglos, or let's call them allophones, they all went to Florida and they said, you know what, guys, good luck. I'm going to go to Florida and come back. And so, it was, so they weren't even there to suffer the pain of the, of, of the, you know, to force a revolution. But like I said, <laughs> what's interesting is that we are in a situation where I say to my sovereignist friends, what a missed opportunity to prove that Quebec could have managed a pandemic better alone or better than any other territory in Canada. Yet we've proven that wave one, we're the worst. Wave two, we're the worst. Wave three, we did not bad. Wave four, we're the first one who got hit and we can't even manage it. Now, we have two accountants. We have Premier Legault, who's an accountant by trade, as an entrepreneur, supposedly. And, I, and, and Dubé is an accountant and, you know, case the depot and everything. So he's not an entrepreneur. He doesn't claim to be either. Both of them, I invited both of them to take a class at Harvard, which is being offered online and entrepreneurship and innovation. I said, if you promise me to take the class and study hard, I'll pay for the classes. <laughs> um, because as accountants, I assume that somebody sat down and did the following math. And we're going to do some math here, okay? Just very simple math. So break it down. We're going to break it down. So we have a hospital. The infrastructure already exists. The cost of those beds, they're already there. And we have all kinds of doctors and staff and whatever. whatever. So if there's one patient or there's 100 patients, 
the basic fixed cost of that infrastructure is there. Same. Okay. Now what's happening? What's happening is we're cutting all kinds of surgeries, so we're saving money, right? Because all kinds of doctors that are not doing those cancer treatments, they're not doing all kinds of the surgeries, they're delaying everything. And we're spending the money on the emergencies. But we still have a problem. We need more money. And I know that, you know, French Canadians have this thing with money. Money is the root of all evil. And as I like to say, money doesn't bring you happiness. But sure as hell pays for better health care mm -hmm. in the case I need it. So, we need more beds. You know it costs money to buy those beds. You're going to have to need a building to put those beds inside. So you need money to buy the building. And then you're going to need more staff. But we don't have the staff. Well, wait up a minute. We do have some staff. See, some of the staff that we have has chosen to go work for the private sector. Because they pay better. The work conditions are better. So if we had more money, we could offer them the same pay, and we would actually, oh, oh, oh yeah, it's true. Don't we have a few doctors who are taxi drivers because they can't pass at 95% that French exam, or we don't want to give them the accreditation for their degree that they got in France, by the way, or in some other Middle Eastern country, which is, by the way, way more advanced medically than we are. You know, so if you got your doctor's degree from from Israel, you're going to have a problem in Quebec. So you're probably moving to Toronto. There's always a problem in Quebec. Oh, but always. But because <laughs> we, need to, we need to isolate ourselves yeah. so that the more of us there is isolated is great. But the fact that we're dwindling the numbers doesn't matter. No. Right? So all of that to say what? To say we needed money. Okay, now. We're not going to go into the liberals spent all the money, the PQ spent all the money, everybody's scamming money, the construction guy. Forget that. Forget. Put all that aside. What I'm saying now is the source of revenue of the government is taxes. So sales tax, income tax. Sales tax, in my case, they get paid every month. So... When you shut down businesses, you're shutting down your source of revenue. Now, somebody says, yeah, but see, we're willing to cut back. No, no, you're not cutting back on anything because the SAQ is still open, right? So as I said on the French media, so I can get drunk, I can go to the pot store and get stoned, but I'm not allowed to go watch a movie. Okay, good luck. It's kind of, and like I said, it took three days, and it was panic, mayhem. How do we control the young, right? Now, the problem is, let's take a concrete example. On the 17th of December, a little movie called, I, I think it's called Spider-Man something. Biggest movie in the world. Biggest movie in the world, $1 billion. Nobody got there that quickly. It's the first movie to get there that quickly in the middle of pandemic without even China playing it. So, pretty impressive. Three days later, you shut us down. Now, from the 17th of December till, say, the 17th of January, in four weeks, I would have generated only the movie theaters. Forget the restaurants, forget any other source of business, you know, forget my real estate properties, all of that stuff. Only the restaurants, only the, the theaters. We would have generated about $10 million gross, including sales tax. So there's a million and a half of sales tax to be remitted to the government, okay? 950,000 goes to Quebec, 550 to our friend Justin Trudeau. Not my friend. He's all right, nice. He's a nice, by the end of this thing, by the end of this podcast, <laughs> you're gonna say, you know what? It's better not, we're gonna like him because he didn't do anything wrong. All he did is just handed out money, right? These are the guys. They're claiming to do things. It would have been better if they just stayed home and didn't do anything because less damage, right? So we're at 8.5 million of net revenue. 20% is my labor cost. It's 1.7 million. 40% DIS and everything because minimum wage, but there's people paid way higher and so forth. So there's another, call it 40% of uh, 1.7 million. You're talking about uh, seven, 670, roughly. So you're talking about another 450,000 to Quebec. So you're talking about $1.3 million. 
Then I got my cost of goods. But you know, my chocolate guy, he's from Sherbro. And my popcorn guy, he's from They're all local. S- some Saint Eustache. Yep. Right? And so when you do the math and you realize that all of these truckers and everybody who's got to deliver these goods, well, that's another 20% labor costs and another... Pro- so at the end of the day, when I did the math you know, at the office with my CFO, we had estimated that out of, five, oh, out of $10 million gross revenue, we would have netted in our pockets about 750000 and the governments would have netted about $4.5 million. Just from you? Just from me. Four weeks. The movie industry. My movie industry. Not Cineplex. Not Everyone all else. of the other independents. And not the gyms. And not the spas. And not the hotels. And not the restaurants. And so now, can we estimate this at maybe $100 million, $200 million, $300 million? Take the money. And do what you got to do. You've got the money. Take the money and spend it. Instead, what did we do? We got out of wave one with a black eye. Two of them, actually. We got out of wave two by saying, we're good, huh? Okay, well, we're going to do better. But, you know, we're going to build a tunnel from Quebec City to the other side. (laughs) And... um, we want uh, Ottawa to pay for it. Uh, we don't know yet how much, though. You know, it's between <laughs> six billion and ten billion. Guys, if I would go to my bank and say I want to build a movie theater, they say, "Great, what's the budget?" Between six million and ten million, my banker would look at me and say, "Tell me something. Whatever you're on, get off him and come and see me <laughs> later and get out of my office." <laughs> like seriously, you right? Either know the numbers or you don't. First of all, second of all. Were we, was it official yet? Were we out of COVID? Was it done? No more threats? No more, what was the world? Did we take off our masks? Not yet. Did we go to 100% capacity in theaters? Not, in fact, no, you closed me down in October 2020. So, I, so, so. And we're already wasting 6 to 10 billion for, I think it was, 300 or 3,000 cars that use, that would use that tunnel a, a day. It's like, seriously, guys, wake up. Stop deviating the attention from a huge fuck-up in wave one and two and get to work. And you know what? Roll up your sleeves, right? And go get the job done. You have the money because you're willing to burn $10 billion on a tunnel. That we don't need right now. Mm-hmm. It's not that we don't need it ever. Right, right now. now. It's all about priorities. Right? In other words, should we be debating Bill 21? No. Now. In the middle of a... Like, like honestly, I, I said this to somebody once. I said, you know, as a, as a lawyer, and I go to court, if, if I see a judge wearing a cross or a pin or something that lets me think he's Catholic, Right? It helps me, actually, because I'm going to play to his Catholic side, right? <laughs> so now you want to make them all vanilla ice cream, okay? Yeah. But, but you think that because I removed my order of Malta pin, that makes me less, less of a member? The only thing is now you don't know that I'm a member. But, so now we've become like, you know, the, the Illuminati's. The, yeah. uh, we're there, but you don't know we're there. Type yeah. of, right? So... so all you're doing is, it's, it's all about semantics and about the appearances. We must show that there are no uh, 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 veiled women in Quebec. But, but why? There are. And what do you care? I'm, I'm just, what do By you the way, care? everybody's veiled right now. But, <laughs> the entire population. That's right. <laughs> so you know, now more than ever, we shouldn't give a fuck about what people are wearing on their heads. You know, my, my in biggest, front of their face. My biggest problem was that I bought this mask... It was a vi- actually it was a visor, full yeah. visor. And I went into a grocery store with the visor, and the manager knew me, and he says, Mr. Gutsu, you gotta wear a mask. Yeah, you know, but with the visor, it's better. He says, well, what do you mean? <laughs> I go, no, no, because my problem is I walk in the aisles, I look at people, they look at me, they recognize me. I smile back. Because I want to make, you know, like I'm not. The problem is with the mask, they don't see me smiling. So they say, for a prison ass. <laughs> you were an asshole, you didn't even say hi to me. But Christ, man, it's like, you know, like with that. You know, like, I mean, how do you but 
The problem is, then we had to do the anti-Anglo bill. Well, 96, 95. Yeah. Like, like, honestly, guys, like, they it's took the this, time. They took this opportunity that everybody, the Quebec population, was paying attention, and they thought, this is the time now. I'm surprised they didn't call a referendum during this. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> meaning, no, no. Meaning, he's not, meaning he's not they, gonna, they, brought, they brought up everything else. You know what I'm saying? And, like, but, but I will tell you this. I'm willing to put money. Okay, we'll we'll do one of those uh, trading places bet. One the chips here. <laughs> one U.S. dollar because we don't know where the Canadian currency will be at. You know, by the time we get this answer in three months, I bet you we will be in an election in April 2022. We won't even get to October with a majority government who has not had a vote of non-confidence. None of that. Just because. Because. Because we do not want a public inquiry digging into our crap, and we need to, at the tip of our popularity, get reelected. This is another federal election. Let's waste well, some money. Trudeau, that's exactly right? what Trudeau wanted to do, and it backfired. Right, but at least Trudeau, in his defense, had the argument of, I'm a minority government. Uh, I don't, I'm not getting the support I'm, I need from the other parties. I'm sick and tired of this crap, and I want an election. That, you know, that could have flown. You're a majority government. You do what the hell you want. So you're, you're predicting an election before the next few months? Before I'm, April? So I'm telling you that I know enough people in the printing business wow. to tell you that there are already signs of M&As, running for the CAC, printed, done, stockpiled, ready to go the minute we get out of this crap to avoid a public inquiry. Vince, if this is the case, this to me should, the public should be disgusted by this possibly happening in the next few months. The fact that their minds are there with the majority government and they would want to go in this direction, considering we're in this deadly pandemic where everything is shut, right and no, and no one's really dying this is insanity so if, if this were to happen how are people this is what i don't get you're passionate you're angry i'm passionate about it, i'm angry there's there's quite a few people like us but the majority of the people stay silent what are they scared about they're quiet and they're accepting of this nonsense it's craziness you know what i want people to do is in Italian, my dad says, people should do il processo all'indenzione. So do the, do the, uh, the, 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 the lawsuits, like the, yeah. you, you know, do the analysis of the lawsuit using what's the intention? Like, wh why are we going to court, for example? Like, mm -hmm. what's the real intention? Not what's written on the paper. What's the real intention, right? So I want people to understand something. If I went, in, if I went into politics, I would be taking a huge pay cut. I would be exposing myself to even more criticism than I get now. So I have no real... You still want to get into politics? I, after I, all this, especially I, I, after what you've seen in the last two years with this pandemic? I'm going to tell you like this. I don't even think I have really a choice anymore. I think it's come to a point where I would be failing my civic responsibilities if I don't continue pushing on the government, demanding a better government, and maybe eventually saying, the hell with it, I might as well throw my hat in the, in, in the race and, and show you guys how it should be done, right? But the idea is this. I drive very nice cars. I have a very nice home. My wife is bombshell gorgeous she's intelligent she has a phd from mcgill i got five wonderful kids and every time i come home i got my female dog and my daughter they're always happy to see me my wife sometimes yeah sometimes <laughs> no, but it doesn't matter right so 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 i could i could be anywhere in new york yeah. i can be in la i could be in punta mita mexico right now vacationing there and saying, I don't care. I but mean, you're in my basement right? at the Real Drive-By no. podcast. What is this man doing here? So, <laughs> you need to ask yourself like this. Yeah. 
why would why is it that I'm here? Why is it that not everybody else is who's in my position is doing the same thing? And it's because maybe they've realized already that it's not worth it. You're not going to get anything out of it. In other words, people don't appreciate maybe or maybe they don't have access to the data that I do. So you do realize that I'm on Dragon's Den. I, you know, I'm, I could be... You're everywhere. I could be Mr. Wonderful and just play the game and, ooh, and, and, I, and I'm like an actor and leave me alone. Right? No, I decided to push on this government because I have the data leaked from their own offices. That's the funniest thing. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and you know that when there's betrayal within your own offices is that you're losing the confidence of your people. It's a matter of time till you lose the confidence of the people, mm -hmm. right? And so I sit there and guys, this is the, these are the numbers. This is the fact. 2015, we had 6,900 deaths in the month of January. All deaths, okay? What are the all deaths this January or January 2020? Well, we'd rather not share the data. What do you mean you'd rather not share the data? You mean you don't want to say that it's 5,700? It's less. Yeah. <laughs> and that's when they say, like, what do you mean? Well, what do you mean? What do I mean? I have the data. Well, how do you have the data? And, and, and if you remember the last podcast we did together, I mentioned to you how it's not enough in life to make money and then give money away. You actually have to, at least my philosophy is, I make money and I will give it away and I will try and influence for better how I'm giving the money away, right? Mm -hmm. So I thought it was cute, funny to say Cinema Guzzo or Guzzo family donates a million dollars to the Jewish general imaging department. Cool, yeah, mm -hmm. cinema, pictures, imaging. imaging. Yeah. Same thing with the Shriners Hospital, 500,000 to the imaging department, right? Never in my right mind did I realize until I got a call from a very, very angry minister of health saying, what the fuck are you doing? What do you mean, what am I doing? You, you, you bought the imaging machine at the Jewish and at the other place. Yeah. And when they wanted to dismantle the old machines, you said, no, 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 no. They're still good, those machines. Yeah, but they're not as, you know, they're not as good for certain. So do the test that they're still good for and double up. With the new machine. Yeah, what's wrong with that? Vince, radiologists are the funnel that controls our budget in healthcare. He says, what are you talking about? So, well, if you're diagnosed with cancer, we then have to send you to a radiologist to get tests done so that then we can determine the treatment, right? If we stall the tests, we don't have to start your treatment, which means we're delaying spending the money on the treatment. Yeah, but you, you're purposely making people wait because of money. Yeah, but why? Because we're already spending too much money. Based on what? In other words, well, Vince, 70 cents on the dollar goes to the healthcare system. So you haven't figured it out yet that maybe there's something being mismanaged. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a, it, it, like, like in the U.S. Army, maybe there's a screwdriver that's worth uh, 15 bucks, uh, Sharona, and it's being sold for $250 or something. Maybe, I don't know, maybe we should like look at that. Maybe, you know, like, uh, and I actually, uh, to be honest, I told him to go fly a kite. And he has repeatedly over the years, I won't mention his name, repeatedly over the years come out and said, oh yeah, I'm going to listen to a movie guy when it comes to healthcare. Yeah, because I'm going to listen to a radiologist when it comes to opening up and doing the right, the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. So what people need to understand is it's our job to keep people accountable, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I said this to you in the past, I've said it many times. There's always five groups when it comes to political warfare. In this case, it's, let's say, me, uh, uh, Legault. Then there's the extreme crazies on the hypochondriac side, which mm -hmm. is, we should all stop breathing 
and, and like just t- so stop surviving and and turn off your TV because uh, uh, electrostatic magnetic uh, nanoparticle craps coming out of them we're all gonna <laughs> die so okay those guys and then there's the other guys that that anything that you inject in you is really bad for you but we have no problem smoking pot sniffing drinking. coke drinking alcohol yeah. to the point of being sloshed right no no, no problem whatsoever with that no no whatsoever and then there's the most important group of all, that silent majority. And they're the hardest people to keep your attention on because we get so distracted in the warfare with the vocal minorities driving us crazy that we forget that the silent majority wants to just be recomforted that you're not a crackpot. Mm -hmm. Here's something clear. I am not a crackpot. I'm double vaccinated. Uh, my kids are all double vaxxed, except for my daughter who's got one. But it doesn't mean if you're not vaxxed that you're a crackpot. No, yeah. but, but this is what I want everybody to realize. I still do not believe that vaccines should be mandatory. Even though you're vaccinated. Even though I'm vaccinated. And the reason for that is because it's a slippery slope. When you start violating people's rights, when you start coming into my bedroom and asking me, uh, are you left, right, or what was you? Oh, uh, Trudeau's father. Said that. Said Trudeau, that. Yeah. We're not in the bedrooms. Yeah, of, don't come in my yeah, bedroom. Yeah. So it's very important that if Jehovah Witnesses are entitled to refuse blood transfusions, and we have to respect that for religious rights protected under the Charter of Rights, then I think we should uh, uh, protect everybody. And, and I want you to realize that only because I'm not a conspiracist, only because I'm not an anti-vax, doesn't mean that it's okay for me to idly stand by and see society beat up on those people. So. So it's something clear. If those people are crackpots, let's say they, let's say the definition that okay, that the government wants it, that they're crackpot. So what are you gonna do? You're not gonna help them. What kind of society are we that we're gonna take people with let's call it mental health issues <laughs> and we're not gonna take care of them? The most vulnerable people, we gotta take care of them. Or we're gonna do what? No, no, no. We're going to put you in a stray jacket. We're going to inject you with two shots. And we, done, we did our job. No, 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 no. That's the problem. The problem is we need to relook at society in general. Why do we have so many senior citizen homes in Quebec per capita versus other provinces? Hi, it's Freeway Frank. We'll get back to the Drive-By Podcast with philanthropist, entrepreneur, and CBC Dragon, Vince Guzzo, in just a second. First, I wanted to introduce to you our lead sponsor here on the Drive-By Podcast, and one of the brands I've been working with for close to a decade, and that is Dormez Vu. I couldn't be more excited to tell you about the New Year, New You event at Dormez Vu. I first remember walking into one of their stores, and one of the Dormez Vu sleep experts really helped me understand how important it is to have a good night night's sleep. Without a good night's sleep, the rest of your life makes no sense. That's the bottom line. What happens when you get better sleep? You train better, believe it or not. Your focus is a lot better. You eat better, and you end up playing harder and working harder and not having to worry about as many things because your body is resting properly during the night. Whatever your New Year's resolution is for 2022, and I know we just started this brand new year and it's a tough time here in Quebec, it all starts with better sleep. And that begins at Dormez Vu. The New Year, New You event is happening there right now. Check them out for brand new a mattress that you've been looking for. Maybe it's bedding you need or a pillow, which is ever so important as well. The Dormy Vu Sleep Experts are available in the store or online to help you out and help you wake up to better sleep. Sleep well, stay well in 2022 and with the Drive-By Podcast <laughs> with Dormy Vu. Thanks, guys. Now back to the show. Where is the respect for my mother and father you know, in Italy, there's no such thing as senior citizen homes. Because they all live at home. Right. 
And when a parent is put in a facility, is because that person has come to the point where they need medical supervision daily, and therefore the nurses are better uh, uh, available in an institution than they are at home Correct. in the middle of La Piazza or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. So, and so w- this pandemic should be asking ourselves, do I want a charismatic university student who managed to get the PQ government to go back on hikes in university in CGEP? Or do we want somebody who's actually bled suffered, went to war, and said, you know what, man? It's not fun. I want you to realize that in the U.S., every president that has served during a military conflict has avoided war. Every president who barely did training camp or even never went to the military always declared war. Because they don't know the casualties of war. They don't understand the cruelty of... You know, the nurses, the doctors, forget the conditions right now. It's horrible. They'll get over it. The problem is them having seen all of those people die and see how disrespected they were, threatened in September, October, November of 2021 by, let's say it, a schmuck, because only a schmuck (laughs) seriously would threaten (laughs) It's true. Our, a our angels, yeah. our angels, right? Yeah. It, it, like, it's, it's not serious. And no. the problem is this. You said the word bully. See, I was 12 years old. I'm an only child. My mom had four other children, two boys, two girls. My mom has thalassemia, uh, which is a blood disorder that, that affects a lot of women uh, who live in the surrounding, uh, all of the countries that surround the Mediterranean. And had I been born in Italy, my mom would have gotten a full blood transfusion immediately after, and I would have had four siblings. Mm-hmm. So as I like to say, I would have shared the family wealth. <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, but, so I'm an only child, my father's an only child, his father was an only child, so this goes back eight generations, right? So the only guy who broke the Broke the mold is me Mm -hmm. that I did. You know, I have four boys and a girl. And it's as as much as it's commonplace today to be an only child. Um, You know, the average Quebec, I I think the average Quebec family has 1.9 kids. Yeah, I was like the 0.9. What was the one tenth missing? You know, but anyway. (laughs) Not all that. uh, No, it's just, you know, (laughs) funny statistical (laughs) joke. Uh, in, In 1980, it was in Riviere des Prairies or St. Leonard or whatever, you know, when I went to Sir Wilfrid Laurier High School, it was not normal to, have, to be an only child. Mm-hmm. It usually meant your parents got divorced or something, something weird happened. Why the hell you People were having children back then. That's right, yeah. right? And I was a small kid, was what I like to say is I was born nice. I was born an angel. And it's life that made me a devil because I had to protect myself Mm -hmm. from four brothers and the bully and this and that. And it was when I was 12 that I said, I'm done. It's enough. It's finished. And I literally beat up four guys. Uh, One at a time, by the way. (laughs) And uh, it cost me... (laughs) Uh, it cost me a year and a half of uh, of social worker, and uh, and uh, I had to hear a judge say that uh, it was not normal that I did not have more friends. Hmm. Oh my God. Ooh. Yeah. Anyway, and so <laughs> so you have to realize that I consider myself to be the underdog, the guy who doesn't fit the mold. And I realized that when I was at Selwyn House in grade nine. And, and, and I want people to realize what sy- systematic, uh, uh, um, systemic, systemic uh, racism is. It's not, hey, you the fucking Italian guy. No, no, it's, oh, you're eating pasta again. Of course. <laughs> how, 
how could I imagine you wouldn't be eating pasta? Mm-hmm. You know, that, that, that's the kind of... So when I went to Selwyn House, I was not supposed to be admitted to the school because my grades weren't there. Let's be honest, I was not a champion student. Uh, I had just gotten into this crazy fight that got me uh, all kinds of legal issues uh, and so forth and so forth. And so it wasn't... Uh, but you know what? My father came there. I wrote the exams. Everything was great. And then all of a sudden... They were going to tell the short Italian guy, hey, your son's not smart enough to come here. And so my father looked at the northern Italian uh, teacher um, uh, who, who uh, taught geography and uh, geology, who, by the way, is Ninkuri, as in the artist Ninkuri that did all of the, the vitrais in, in Quebec, you know, okay. the churches. The church is the, is yeah. the, um, the, the grandson. Okay. Uh, of that person, right? And so my father looks at him and says, let me understand how you guys work here. You take a bunch of 90 students from all over the place, you bring them here, and then they graduate with a 90 average and you applaud that you guys are good. Reminded me of Lego, you know? He does all the things and then he claps. He blames yeah. everybody else, but he does everything good. And so my father says, why don't you do this? Take a 70 student. Show me you can make him an 85 student. Then you'll get my respect. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's sort of you know, a little ding, and the guy you know took a took a bit of fence at it, whatever. But they let me in. You know what my first day at that school was? It was to be called at principals at uh, in private schools are called headmasters. Mm-hmm. So I went to the headmasters, and thank God that person's no longer there. And he <laughs> sat me down, and he says, "You know, Mr. Gutso, I said, so you can call me uh, Vince. I, I, I'm going to call you Mr. Gutso." So for a 13-year-old, it didn't dawn on me, when somebody doesn't want to call you by your first name, it's, we ain't becoming friends, you and I, okay? You stay in your corner, I stay in my <laughs> corner. All right. So he says to me, he says, you know, Mr. Good, so you're now at Selwyn House, right? It's not father and mother, it's father, mother. What the frick? What the hell is he talking about? That's what I said. <laughs> but sir, I said mother, father. No, you said mother, but you know. So, so, so. What I'm trying to tell you is, from day one. But you know what? Three years later, graduated from that school. The school helped me with my dyslexia. I gave a shitload of money back to that school. All my kids went to that school. I got honored this year as the Spears Medal, which is the highest award the school gives. And it's funny because the teacher who gave me the award is the teacher that the Italian, Northern Italian teacher, and he said, and it's because we had to do it remotely because of COVID. Yeah. Uh, he said in his speech, he says, two, three days in, Vince beat up a guy in the schoolyard. <laughs> and he was going to get expelled because no, no such thing as fighting in the schoolyard. And I will never forget that day because I was going to get expelled. Mm-hmm. But I had told the, head, the, the, the headmaster, says, but sir, I don't get it. He called me a friggin' wop. Yes, but there's no reason to hit him. But sir, he's never going to call anybody a WAP again. Trust me. <laughs> he, I give him a lot. He should be paying me. What are you doing? Suspending me. Right? So, so you can understand that when you grow up, always being pushed around like that and realizing you can't always. And I couldn't tell that headmaster, go fly a kite. Mm-hmm. Apart the fact that I was 13. What do you want me to tell? He's a grown up. He's a man. I'm terrified. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like, like for me, like I grew up in a place where you had to be nice to policemen. Mm-hmm. They could arrest you. Yeah. Today, what is no doing? respect. Hey, go see a policeman. Yeah. I dare you. Touch me. Touch me. Come on, you fucking pig. Touch me. You know, it's like, seriously? Like, the guy, like, the guy's trying to do his job, man. Mm-hmm. And so, I want people to realize that nobody's, nobody's coming to save you. There's no second coming to Christ, guys. I, I'm not the savior either. I'm a guy who's angry. Very upset. Very, very upset of the fuck ups, yes, but even more upset of being lied to. Systematically, every time. Every time. Like, like, like guys, let's remember can you take the thing out of the way? I, I, it distracts me. It's called a teleprompter and it's got the <laughs> message that you're supposed to be reading. So, what are you delivering to me? You, you, and, and, Another idiot, because a few of them that I have to cross to. Uh, clearly, you don't know what uh, the system 
the alert emergency system is used for, it's not only an Amber alert. Hey, moron, let's get something clear. That system was developed, first and foremost, for an Amber alert. And only an Amber alert. And only an Amber alert. Then, the President of the United States, the most powerful man in the world, said, I will use this in the extreme crazy occasions that I must address the country, the nation, but it must be done after 10 minutes, within 10 minutes of it ringing. Mm -hmm. So that means it's a nuclear war. W we're being attacked. Something crazy. At 6.45 on December 31st. New Year's Eve. My heart popped for a split second saying, what kind of piece of shit grabs a kid on New Year's Eve? That's what I thought. I, I like, go, what kind an of an animal? Yeah. Like, like, seriously. And now with this curfew that's going to come in, it's going to be even worse. Like, like nobody's going to be able to search for this guy. To open my phone and realize Shot. that it's, hey, yeah. by the way, you know, you got a... Is it a joke or what? Yeah. Like, 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 do people really have no more decency on violation of like look you don't want to go to church on sunday don't go to church on sunday you you, you want to say happy holidays say happy holidays but you know what guys let's get something clear the 25th of december is a day called christmas mm -hmm. don't 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 call it journée des patriotes le 20, don't call it not the 21st of whatever <laughs> is it victorious it is. day yeah. call it whatever you want but it, but so let's seriously Get back to some normality. Stop with the, he's a prick, he's an asshole, he, he's a worm. It's a, you know, it's a bigger theory from the Illuminati's. Uh, guys, I have had, regretfully, too many exchanges with too many of our politicians. And I think in French, the expression is, Chris que ça fait zero. Huh? It's hard. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard sometimes because they sit there like, huh? huh? Why? Why? Why are you? Why are you premier? Like seriously? Like like what the hell? And you have to remember, as a premier, people like to say, yeah, but well, well, you, you're a businessman. You think it's not very different running a corporation than running a country. It's the end results are different. Mm -hmm. In a corporation, profit, you don't care. That's what you're looking for. And then you appease your conscience by, you know, community involvement. As a government, community well-being is 100% of your, your goal. Mm -hmm. That's why money gets wasted, right? Because it's not about the money. It's about what's the positive effect on the community. Okay. So my problem now is that we spent... 470 billion dollars that's not to say what quebec spent and toronto spent and ontario spent and all the other guys okay but we've indebted ourselves more than we will ever be able generations to pay generations to come that's right and you have a businessman who's willing to step up and say open up the theaters i want to pay you 1.5 million dollars in sales tax <laughs> you do whatever the f you want with the money okay i would advise you to give it to the hospitals but before you give it to them without any consequence do what i do when i gave money to an to a, to a, a, um, a chair a research chair at the university of montreal which was the um chair de recherche en environnement cancer goodzo at the University of Montreal, I demanded every year an update from the researchers saying, what did we learn more today? So mm -hmm. for those of you who don't know it, the experts who testified against the tobacco companies is a guy called Jack Simietti, who happens to be the researcher that I funded in his research in environment cancer, which is what in our environment makes you more likely to get this kind of cancer versus another kind of cancer, mm -hmm. right? So, so what I'm trying to tell you is you are allowed because you pay income tax to say, guys, 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 
what the hell are you doing with my money? Of course. Can you, why is it that I can't get the service that I'm expecting? Why is it that other countries can deliver, right? And, and we can't. And why is it that when the premier says, uh, uh, I was looking at uh, CNN and I saw, so I took some of my ideas on wave one from CNN. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, but on most of my tw Twitter posts and my Facebook posts, I always tag CNN. <laughs> I, you know, I got told by the government, can, can you stop tagging CNN? Why? Well, because it... It embarrasses them. Yeah, it embarrasses us a bit. Uh, yeah, because, but, but you should be embarrassed. Oh. And, and that's exactly what we, the people, should be doing. Yeah. We should be standing up. Holding them accountable. Holding them accountable. Not breaking windows of poor businesses that have been forced to shut down. No, don't do that. Don't do that. But telling these politicians, hey guys, it doesn't work that way. In other words, I want you to realize we have a, a, a mayor in Montreal. She... <laughs> I don't know why, but she declared a sanitary emergency again, even her. I guess it's because it gives you the latitude to do what the hell you want. You, the opposition doesn't even have to be noticed. You just spend the money. But do you realize that I have movie theaters that have had to pay 100% of their property taxes, but my theater was closed? You don't catch a break. I don't know. At all. There's no break whatsoever. So I paid six and a half months more property tax than months that I was open in 2020. And I paid now, technically I lost half a month in December, then May, so five, and I paid five and a half months too much. Mm -hmm. So that means I paid one year of property tax. Now, let's get something clear. Property taxes on your home are governed by, you know, we can't go up too much, people are gonna get mad at us. On businesses, they kill us. Mm -hmm. Just just so we're clear, I opened a movie theater in St. Jean sur le Richelieu because I can't afford to open a movie theater on the island of Montreal anymore. The property taxes represent more than the rent I pay. So on my Marché Central theater, I pay more in property tax than I do in rent to the landlord. Crazy. And I want you to understand that when I don't pay the rent to that landlord, it's not a smart idea to say, I don't care if Guzzo lost money. But Guzzo didn't lose that much money. But that landlord didn't get paid. Mm -hmm. And he can't continue paying his employees. Or he's working on a reduced. Oh, and But I don't care. We're all getting 500 bucks a week. Yeah, great. And by the way, you don't have to pay income tax on that. Yeah. They're ready to do it because it's coming around the corner. And so I want you to realize that it's okay to be angry. It's okay to, to say, fuck everybody. It's a big conspiracy. Guys, let's, let's bring it down a notch and tell yourself like this. I told the government on a tweet and on, on, a, on a Facebook post, I said, instead of talking about this goddamn passport every two minutes and backdooring something that you could do through the front door, which means you want to force people to get vaccinated. Be a man, put your pants on, be a man. Sanitary emergency gives you that right. So do it. Now, I want you to realize, guys. You're not advocating I'm for... Not, no, I'm not. You're I mean, just making the point. I'm making the point that if I have the power to force you to do something, why am I monkeying around trying to get my wife to convince you but me, I could force you. So why do I have to go through 101 threats, through this, through that to get... Why don't I just say, hey, buddy, this is the, the law. Is. The new law is you have to get vaccinated. Let's get the hell out of the province. Why? Because if you do that, now that right, forced vaccination, is only under. existing under sanitary. a sanitary emergency yep. decree. Which means no sanitary emergency no vaccine obligations. So now, what would happen if Legault did do that? Well, maybe somebody like Mr. Guzzo would say, great, give me my two shots. Here's my lawyer's notice. 
let's go to court because I want an injunction. I don't think you have the criteria to meet a sanitary emergency, which means the amount of debts must be disproportionate to the normal amount of debts. Now you know why you don't have the data. Because we can't, we don't want you, the people, to establish the normal amount of debts. Because once the people know that, then it's game over. That's right. Right? So, so it's, it's not about defying the police. It's not about defying. It's about stopping the insult, pointing the finger to where the problem is. The problem is you're hiding information. The problem is you're not sharing the data. The problem is you've muzzled the ruder. Because the minute a ruder went to the National Assembly and he was asked, he said the truth. He's under oath. Yep. And you can't even fire him for saying the truth. Right? So, so people need to understand. My taunting or my I dare you isn't about vaccines. I don't I got no money in the vaccine business. I don't care. And even if I did have money in the vaccine business, uh, let's say I was a shareholder of a public company like Pfizer. Oh, really? Like, how, how many shares do you think I own? All right, so, ooh, your revenue went up. Ooh, my stock went up a dollar. Ooh, I made a lot of money. Big deal. So, it's about how can I argue against a sanitary emergency? So, I want you to realize, somebody said to me, I said, if they close me down again, I'm taking these, these pricks to court. And at the time when I said it, some guy on social media said, yeah, that's, that's nice. We already wasted all this money and we're already like in debt and now you're going to go ask for a big check for damages and so forth. Thanks, Guzzo. Okay, clearly that guy doesn't know anything about income tax, right? Because right now, Cinema Guzzo, after 24 odd months, has a, an accumulated loss of about 20 million bucks. Not Manka Gagne, not I didn't make $20 million of profit. No, 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 no. Out of pocket. I paid employees. I got part of it back. Mm -hmm. right? I want you to understand. Wage subsidy is part of the money. It's a cap. Uh, rent subsidy, capped at 75000 My taxes per month at Marché Central are over 75000 So imagine, so you give me seventy five, you're not really helping. You know, like I still have to pay the other half mm -hmm. type of thing. So... What I want everybody to realize is that once a corporation has lost money, it offsets those losses with future profit. Mm -hmm. So if I don't sue the government, I have 20 odd million of accumulated losses. I am paying income tax, corporate income tax for a few years to come. That means you're not getting the money you need for your hospitals, for your protection of the French language, for your protection of the backgammon club of I don't know what <laughs> arrondissement, I don't know where on plateau, something, whatever. But the longer you stay closed, the worse it is for Quebec society. That's right. But not only me, everybody, everybody, everybody yeah. right? Now, what that person didn't understand is if I sue the government, part of the reason is to denounce the government and say, hey, schmuck, you openly answered a Gazette journalist who said, do you think, did you ever imagine you were going to get a popcorn gate in Quebec? And he said, I, uh, if you would have told me, uh, no, I would never talk of that, uh, but uh, you know, it's okay. I, I'm going to compensate Mr. Gutsu. Uh, not a problem. Uh, I will pay him for the profits he loses on the popcorn. And she asked the question, what do you mean? Well, I think it, it's only normal if I decide not to let them sell the popcorn. I decide. Mm -hmm. Not public health. Yeah. I, the premier of Quebec, decide. decide mm -hmm. because, uh, it's, because it's a question of perception, of image. Yeah. Right? Because I don't want all the restaurateurs, the 20,000 restaurants in Quebec to be angry at me. I want to punish the cinema guy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a political decision. So the damage that you created me in operating movie theaters without the sale of foodstuffs, which means we were at five, six, seven percent. So by the way, I didn't open. I actually had enough guts. I'm not going to use the I'm not going to use the B word, but guts to say, you know what, asshole, you either open me, 
for what my business is meant to be, which is movies, popcorn, and arcades. Thing. It's yeah. the whole package or nothing. Because yeah. this crap there that you're going to piece. Remember when I said I gave him four things and he only remembered one? Yeah. Okay. It's the same thing he does all the time. So I posted on, I think it was Facebook. I said, you guys want to understand what public health recommendations are? They're like a, a recipe for tiramisu, right? So you got, let's say, four ingredients, four quantities. Yeah, you, know, you can tweak. If you're a good pastry guy, you can tweak, you can do, but normally you have four and four. If Aruda gives you eight recommendations, he's not telling you, pick and choose the ones you want. He's saying, this is what I would do to keep people safe. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Mm -hmm. Then they say, okay, so it's multiple choice. The one I want to pick. Okay, you take my mother's tiramisu recipe. <laughs> you start changing sugar for, I don't know, some other goddamn turmeric. Because you, you don't like sugar. Sugar's the devil. So I'm going to put turmeric because it's better. For, it's not it, the same recipe. For some, it's not the same recipe. No. Second of all, you ain't, you, you ain't getting a tiramisu. No. <laughs> so how could you, as a premier, blame Aruda or public health for recommendations they did, which you cherry-picked? So Aruda said in December of 2020, not only did he say, I did not ask for the closure of restaurants. You got to remember, had he said, I considered it, but then I, I never asked for it. But if he didn't ask for it, how did he even come up with the idea, the other schmuck over there? Mm -hmm. That means that they've already come to their own game plan. Yep. And the game plan is this. We need to appear to be doing something so that when shit hits the fan, because we don't know what's going exactly. to happen. Exactly. Shit, so... We're can, not responsible because we tried. That's so I can exactly. tell you one thing. I can tell you that when public health was asked in, uh, I'd say, seven, eight days into December, what's this thing going to blow up to? You know what the answer was? We don't know. We, we can't even begin to quantify because we don't know yet how this thing is spreading we're looking at south africa we're looking at we're trying to see everywhere the only thing that's good is it's very mild people are not dying yeah and, and that's where if you remember well that's really where the record is because we can't blame the government for you going to a hockey game you decided to go to a hockey game you decided to infect twenty one thousand other people i can't really blame the government some guy had a pre-existing condition, got COVID, he died. Can I blame the government? Yeah, there was no beds for him. But if there was beds, can't blame the government. So the only thing the government, the only number the government had control over was not the number of cases, was not the number of deaths. It was the number of beds. That's it. 20 months. And what did they do? They took 1,400 beds. Claimed, I like this one, claimed that because we wore out our guardian angels, those beautiful people, but you forgot that you threatened them two months ago, mm -hmm. threatened to fire them all, <laughs> every single one of them, you had no problem threatening them, but now those, those, those saviors, I'm, me personally, I admire the nurses and the doctors that told our government, go F yeah. yourself. Uh, yeah. In other words, I have doctors who said, I want to get the vaccine, but I'm waiting after the deadline because I'm not doing, because I want to make it clear, I'm getting the vaccine because I want the vaccine, not because they're forcing me to, first of all. Second of all, there's doctors who have said to me, your father needs the vaccine more than I do. Tell him he can come and get it. Because mm -hmm. he's 76. I'm only 54. Right. And, and it's okay that I'm in, in the middle of the, of the warfare. That's my job. That's my oath mm -hmm. to be there. That's what we should be talking about. That's what we, not 
Trudeau didn't send us enough uh, rapid tests. You know what? Mr. Legault, call up, go test rapid. They got tons of tests, and they can even donate some to you if you want. You know, it's one of those private clinics where you can go yeah. get tested, right? He can get all the tests. How come he can get all the tests he wants to make money off? I mean, you can't. Like, come on, mm -hmm. let's be serious here, right? Or you know that there's backdoor arguments going on when the Liberal Party of Canada shares information with me. Come on, man. <laughs> I'm as blue as you're going to get. <laughs> but the, and they tell me, you know that Lago and Zubay had 8,000 third booster shots available as of the end of August, early September, right? The hell did we wait till, mm -hmm. till now to release it? Well, 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 if you really, well, it's because their reasoning was we got to convince more people to get one and two before we start giving three out. My, my, you guys are stupid, right? Like, like, I mean, you guys are real dumb. Like, you knew that the first one and twos were expiring, that they were supposedly no good. Give the number threes to the 60 and up. Do, do you know, like, like, but no, we're just keeping information. We're not putting all of the pieces on the table, right? I had a lawyer once, a guy called Bruno Pateras. He said to me, I'm your lawyer. Whether I like you or not doesn't make a difference. I'm your lawyer. Whether you're guilty or not doesn't make a difference. I'm your lawyer. So don't bullshit me. Give me the real story. At mm -hmm. least I know what I'm dealing with. <laughs> right? Yep. And that's where the problem is. Yep. If the government told you, right? Frank, we have no choice. And almost cried and, and you know, made you feel the, the honesty. I'd believe it. You'd believe it. Yep. But when the guys, one day it's... Uh, it's not my fault. No, it's, it's them. It's, it's the Anglo's who ran the private, uh, the private uh, senior citizen homes that created the ten thousand deaths. Yeah, because right now, from what I remember, the number was eighty percent were from the public sector mm -hmm. senior citizen homes, not the private. So, but but let's have a public inquiry on the one owned by an allophone. It's easy to villainize. Of course, you know, the fingers, Middle Eastern, yeah. Yeah. it's easy, right? Yeah. Uh, but, and then it's Trudeau's fault I didn't get my vaccine. Yeah. And then it's Trudeau's fault he didn't close the borders. And then it's Trudeau's fault. But there has been a lot of mismanagement on, on every on level. On every level. Federal, provincial, right. municipal. Right. And now, look, we're at a we're at a point where we have, what, 17, I, I lost track, 17,000, 18,000 cases a day, where most doctors are admitting and most research is saying that this is a, the Om Omicron variant is very mild. So you have more people going and get tested, Vince, so more people are in line in the cold, minus 20 degree weather here in Montreal, to get tested for something they know they already have. They have the flu, they have a variant of COVID-19, and they're harming themselves, I think, by being outside in line, waiting to, to find out the information they already know. The cases are going up, okay? So there's way more cases. And based on those numbers, we are panicking again and shutting everything down when the deaths are nowhere close to the uh, beginning of the pandemic and the original Delta variant at all, not even close. But so... No one's dying. Th this breaks my heart because, sure, there are cases. I mean, you hear it all the time. I post something on and somebody says, Frank, you don't know. I have a family member that's in ICU. They're unvaxxed. I have a, fa a family member that's in ICU. They're vaxxed. You don't know. You're not a doctor. You know, follow the science. I'm, we're not trying, and I'm not trying to, to say that. The science, look, a doctor told me yesterday, the science is always changing vince it's always changing but that's the problem frank see the problem is and you said it. yeah people believe so because when we went to school we learned mathematics and two plus two makes four even though there's some creative accountants who can make it be worth three and others make it something be worth else right? Uh, five right uh, enron is a good example toilet yeah. paper costs uh, 50 cents a roll but it's worth 50 bucks on their books okay so so we know there's a way to fudge the number. fudge the numbers yeah. the problem is when people do an automatic association between the purity of mathematics very cartesian very two plus two makes four and science Right? Science said, look, my wife has a master's in psych psychiatry. 
mm-hmm. and she has a PhD in child psychiatry from McGill. Let me tell you, I've seen her write one theory at science. And five years later, say, eh, we just realized this, 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 this. And the facts change. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, why? Because science is an evolving uh, uh, thing. It's like, it's like a human. It grows. The more things change, the, so I, I move my left arm. This is the reaction it creates in science. Okay, but if, what if I move my right arm? It creates another reaction. What if I move both together? Well, then do this, right? So we were working on developing a high blood pressure pill. We ended up with the best sexual stimulant ever, mm-hmm. Viagra. But we were looking to do- Something entirely different. Uh, totally different. Yeah. But science brought us somewhere else. Yeah. And they cashed out, they made a shitload of money. So science is about repeated tests with modifications to see, well, you know, we tested, so for example, I, I'm invested in a medical research company, which is with McGill University and the, uh, the Jewish General Hospital. It's basically a cancer treatment, which would be non-invasive, meaning I'm not cutting you open, uh, or not cutting you open in 99% of the cases, and I'm not injecting you with chemo or poison or God knows, you know, nuclear pill or something, mm-hmm. whatever. What I'm doing is I'm taking a, a you know, I'm going to vulgarize it. I'm taking a sample of your cancer. I'm putting it on synthetic nanoparticles. I'm injecting it into your body, and the nanoparticles who have the cancer now that you have will, like magnets, attract to other cancer cells because cancers are like wolves. Cancer cells are like wolves. They pack together. Mm-hmm. And then you put you under a, a, an X-ray machine, and you light up like a Christmas tree of all the nanoparticles. And all I got to do is I go zap those nanoparticles, and boom, there goes the cancer. Now, mm-hmm. if your cancer cells too close to your vocal cord, in your case, I can't do anything. We got to go in manually and take it out because or else I'm going to make you mute, mm-hmm. right? And so forth and so forth. Now, only because it says in the description of that nanoparticles, oh, my God. Oh my God, I mean, he, he's trying to track people. Honestly, guys, your lives is not, lives are not that interesting that I want to track you, right? Yeah. So let's get that. Oh, right. there's the conspiracy th- yeah, theories. But, that's, but, but I, I, need, I need for all of us who have cousins, brothers, sisters, relatives, to tell those people there's a bigger fight here, which is way more important, which is removing the sanitary emergency decree which, by the way, has been renewed every 10 days automatically without any vote in the National Assembly, Mm -hmm. which means, do the math, it's about 62 times. Makes no sense. It's crazy. Like, like, this is insane. But the science. So when Arruda said masks don't help, and then three months later says "Masks, masks will help, everybody shit all over. But guys, you do realize that that happens often in science, that they have their blinders on, they're convinced that COVID was, remember, a surface issue. Remember at the beginning it was- Then they realized it was airborne. Then they realized it was airborne, right? And so, oh, now we have another problem. But then the other problem that I say is, so the biggest problem we're gonna have is it's airborne, so I'm talking, it's gonna hit the table, it's gonna hit the floor, whatever. What's the lifespan of this thing? Uh, 24 hours, 48 hours. Are you kidding me or what? Just like that. It's going to live like this, this thing. Mm -hmm. Right? That statement is as stupid with no scientific backing whatsoever as we all have dormant cancer cells in us. Mm -hmm. You are kidding me, right? Mm -hmm. Dormant cancer cell. Uh, Listening. (laughs) uh, uh, Cells. Uh, they're alive. Mm-hmm. They don't sleep. D- their, their raison d'être is to be awake. Mm-hmm. So what we should be telling people is we in Canada have loved to waste money on other stuff and we can't afford the imaging equipment to detect the even smaller cancer cells that are in your body 
And therefore, if you've had cancer, after five years of reduction of numbers, you're in remission, but you have possibly, you possibly have dormant cancer cells. There's no such thing as a dormant cancer cell. I had a whole discussion with a guy in LA that I sent to him uh, a dead mouse that had cancer that cost me 10 grand to do the test for this cancer research thing that we were doing. And the guy says, what? What did you say? He says, I don't know. I'm trying to figure out, is there any dormant cancer cells? Fuck are you talking about? <laughs> the dormant cancer cells. You're from Canada, right? Yeah, yeah. Another guy that's in another world. What do you mean? There's no such thing as dormant. If it's in your body, it's alive. It, nothing sleeps in your body. It's awake. Like, get over it. So it's, it's a doctor's way of vulgarizing I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know if you still have cancer after five years. But what do we know? We know that if we all took our poo and had the money to analyze our poo from a very young age, we have dead cancer cells in our poo, mm -hmm. which means what? Which means our immune system from a very young age fights off cancer. Ah, it's cool. How come we can't do it all the time? <laughs> and our immune system fights off COVID. There you go. And so the whole idea is, who is it that cannot fight cancer? Who is it that can't fight COVID? Who is it that dies from the flu? Who gets meningitis? Who, who, right? Okay. People that, for example, you, you know, like, I was fat. I lost a lot of weight. You know, if I was fatter, does that put me more at risk? Yes. I, is it the weight or is it my predisposed conditions that, too. that is I'm genetic, sure. yeah. right? And then the right. cancer environment chair that I, that I, that I uh, funded for many years, their primary goal, just to vulgarize it, was you take an Asian woman in China, she is more likely to have ovarian cancer than breast cancer when she gets into her 30s. You take her from China, you bring her to Canada. She's still living with the same people, she's still living with her. Her likelihood of ovarian cancer drops to nothing. Her likelihood of getting breast cancer skyrockets. She now has breast cancer. Why? So what is it, right? Environment. That we're pre yeah. Environment. So, so there's all kinds of stuff that affect that scientific result. Mm -hmm. So when I hear guys or people on social media or even doctors, you know, the media has a responsibility to, at the very least, get some credentials. Like, like, let's get something clear. But they're not asking the right questions. They're well, not challenging the government. It's it almost the media and the government seem to be in the same bed, and and any big corporation. It's the shaming. No, but it's the shaming, Frank. Right? You have to understand that when we've made it to the point that the minute you contest the government, you're a conspiracist. No, I'm not a conspiracist. I that's just, a problem. But that's words, where we are in the world right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. But but see, but but where the problem is is that. People need to man up or woman up because the future is female, right? So man, uh, woman up and, and say it. Hey, hey, I'm not denying COVID. No one's denying I'm denying the intelligence that you're lacking in this. That's I'm saying there's no intelligence in your decision. In your handling of it. Yep. In other words, the whole world is going through this. Really? Because I don't see many people with the track record that Quebec has. No. Right? And I want people to understand. I know that, that, you know, a lot of people saw my posts on Belgium theaters contesting and so forth and so forth. And they're all saying, oh, you know, you should do the same thing. If you stay open, I'll come and support you. But, but you have to take out the passport. You got to do this. And you got to do that. You gotta, tell me something. If I just stayed open and you stayed home, but I stayed open and it pissed off the government enough to get all of this to stop. Well, is that still okay? Or, or do I really have to give you the satisfaction of removing the passport? And this? In other words, let's fight the fight that's going to end it all instead of picking and choosing. Oh, let's contest the curfew. Who oh, the fuck cares about the curfew? At 10, at 10 o'clock at night on a Monday, me, I'm home anyway. So it's not a problem. Now, why, why is there a curfew again? Oh, yeah, it's true because there's a sanitary emergency let's that stick gives them to the right. The, yeah. That's right. The so yeah. the, the, the common link to... The vaccine passport, uh, 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 
forced vaccination, closures, uh, yeah, curfews, closures, 50% capacities, nobody home for this. Nobody. All of it is based on sanitary emergency. Uh -huh. So what the hell are we like talking about? Why is social media talking about everything else but sanitary emergency? That's the only thing. Because people think, see, and that's where Lego is brilliant. I'm telling you, he's not the brightest guy in the world, but he's brilliant when it comes to the political strategy of using Trump's, I can say, any stupidity. And because of who I am, people will believe me. So we are in an emergency sanitary situation because our hospitals are being overrun. Who cares? The truth of the matter is that's not what that, that, that decree is for. That decree is for... We are being affected by a virus, or there's the Spanish flu, and we lost 33%. People are dropping dead. 33% yeah. of the population. We have a problem. Now we have a hell of a problem. Yeah. Well, that's what it's not there for. We mismanaged our budget this year, and we Therefore. took off too many beds, and because that's the other thing I couldn't understand, right? During all of wave one, two, and three, we had 1,400 beds. All of a sudden, we have a problem because we're at. 200 beds on out of 800. My, what the fuck? So it's scary. But what happened yeah. to the other 600 beds? Exactly. Right? So I called up yeah. a few of the hospitals that I donate money to. Guys, what happened to the beds? Mm -hmm. ah, they're here. Yeah, I know, but why is he not counting them? Matt Vince, because it's a little harder to shut down when you're at 200 people with 1,400 beds, right? So you're at 15% capacity. Mm -hmm. What's the urgency? When you're at 25%, and then when you get to 400, now you have four, you have 50%. Mm -hmm. Hey, look at that. We have to start closing now. So it's all about working the numbers the right way, right? So, so as an entrepreneur, I understand that better than anybody. You know why? Because we got to prepare forecasts. We got to go see our bankers and say, look, guys, I got this project. Here's where we're at. Here's oh. this where we're at. This is the numbers. This is how we're going to do it. This is what. So we're massaging those numbers all the time. But you know what happens? Once, you're wrong. Eh, you know what happens? COVID. I didn't think about COVID. Twice, you're wrong. My wife, she gave me grief, and so I wasn't concentrating. Third time, you're wrong. My son, he broke his leg at skiing, and I was distracted. Oh, my, is it possible that you don't know what the hell you're talking about? Because now it's the fifth time you give me forecast, and you're always wrong. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool that's me right. twice, shame on me. That's right. And that's where now the problem is. Right? The problem is... It's not me. You, you, you know, what, what I can't understand about some of the haters on social media is, I say, Dubé, you're a liar. You said to us mm -hmm. in September that we have to stop looking at the number of cases because that number is going to become secondary. Because with the amount of people vaccinated... It doesn't matter because the vaccine, it's not guaranteeing that you're not getting COVID. It's guaranteeing mm -hmm. that you're less likely to go to the hospital. Okay. But that's not what they told us in the beginning, but well, that's a different story. No, but they <laughs> switched it in the middle. And like, so we're not supposed to look at the number of cases. Then you tell me we're supposed to start to learn to live with it. Then you say to make entertainment safe, we're only going to force you to have double vaxxed people look I told my theater owners association says you guys are fucking crazy mm -hmm. he's gonna shut you down again he will not think about it twice if he's gonna have a problem of appearances he's gonna shut us down again no don't worry about it you're so negative all the time T -t. why do you have so little faith in him cause he lied to me for the last 20 months mm -hmm. I mean and every time it's like it's like you know what it's like I have five kids. Thank God, none of them have any consumption issues. But it's exactly, I feel like I'm talking to somebody who has a severe drug addiction. Mm -hmm. I swear, I swear, no, no, this time's the right time. We're yeah. stopping. <laughs> We're going to do that. And again, and again, and again. You know, but there's no AA for politicians, mm -hmm. for the lying, right? And people don't understand that Lying is a disease. Let's get something clear, mm -hmm. guys. If we're going to progress as a society from now till whatever, mental health, 
So you've been to my white party mm -hmm. numerous times. It's a mental health advocacy awareness event. We want to point out that dyslexia, anxiety disorder, whatever, nothing to be embarrassed about. Mm -hmm. You can get help and, and you can live a perfectly normal life and be happy and so forth. So we're going to have a lot more of those people with all of this craziness. And you know what? People are going to trust a lot less the government. And we're going to have a lot more conspiracy theorists because when it's going to come out that the government blatantly and openly lied to us repeatedly, systematically, what do you think my cousins are going to tell me? I told you so. Yeah. I told you so. And, they, and, and they won't be wrong. That's right. <laughs> but the problem is that there still is no mastermind in switzerland in the alps going tee, 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 you know the 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 kingsman uh, version uh, yeah. part two it doesn't exist now that everybody's trying to abide to a stupid plan or that that 10 premiers call themselves up and go, okay guys you know trudeau doesn't give a shit about our hospitals because he ain't paying for them we are and trudeau's not gonna close the borders down they don't want to listen to us so How's about you there, Ford? You start putting the theaters at 50% capacity. Then two weeks later, I'm going to do the same. And then I'm going to do... It's like you look at them going, it's like, look at that. Oh, he's going to do that. So today at 2 o'clock, I think, or 1 o'clock, whenever... No, at 12 o'clock, yep. Ford announced the closure of all restaurants, theaters, or whatever. Monkey see, the, monkey do. That's right. Yep. Because now, his people, what are they going to say? I can't believe you did that. Ma, Quebec did it three weeks ago. Yeah. So I'm not that bad, right? And then, and they're going to try and deviate this, this, but that's not, so, you know, somebody asked me, what kind of a politician would I be? And I said, a really bad one. And he says, what do you mean? You wouldn't be a politician. Well, no, but, <laughs> my, but that's, see, my whole idea is I would, I'm the kind of guy that would probably go on air and say, okay, guys, we fucked up. For 40 years, we didn't take care of our health care system. And now we have a problem because we got a bunch of these old people. It's really bad, man, because they're going to die. So do me a favor. Can you, like, slow it down with this and that? Because I need to manage this. I, I can't let those people die. I, I, like, you got to help me help those people. You know, people would have felt. At the beginning, maybe. Yeah. Even after you yeah. said the second wave, maybe the yeah. third. But now... Yeah. Now no, no, but now, no, but yeah. now the problem isn't that. Now the problem yeah. is, somebody said to me, "Yeah, but look, nobody's, you know, none of the old people are dying anymore. You did a good job. You see, what are you talking about? He killed most of them off anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we if we had a purge, and we killed a quarter of the population, we wouldn't have a population uh, control issue. Mm -hmm. Well, every every few years we kill twenty five percent off. We're good, right? So it's like it's stupid what you're saying. First we abandon them. First we let them die. And then we say, you see, we did good the second wave. Not many of them died, but there's mm -hmm. not many of them left. Yeah, you, you didn't take care of them enough, right? And same thing with the the the, the doctors. I told the government, the guys, you got to stop with the compliments. Oh, our angels, our our, our guardian angels. You got to stop, eh? got to stop because it's starting to sound like bullshit. Mm -hmm. Those people are saying, guys, thanks for the compliments. But I mean, my work conditions, they still suck over here. Mm -hmm. Still the same. So can we do, can we put some money where your mouth is type of thing, right? And so people need to understand that sometimes what's said, what's done, what's right. So let's go to Paris for a minute. Remember I saw you were going to come back to Paris. Mm -hmm. So I funded a documentary on Jacques Parizeau, which is going to be released. It, it was done by a team of Quebec, French-Canadian uh, um, TV guys, you know, and, 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 and movie guys and so forth. And it was funny because when I announced to my team that we were going to help produce the movie financially, I, I, had, I have no say whatsoever in the movie, except for maybe they're going to interview me and put a clip of me in there, uh -huh. is I say this often. Jacques Parizeau was not a racist. Or at least, he was not a racist with the comment he made at the result of the second referendum. Uh -huh. And he said, well, how could you say that? He said, money and, uh, and uh, immigrants. Okay, so money 
It's not a race. So, so it's not a race. The immigrants, it's not even a race. Because there's French from Paris that immigrate. So, so, but they're French. Why would they? The truth of the matter is, as I said once to a bunch of Italian businessmen who were sitting around the table and said, we've got to write a letter to the Gazette and denounce the fact that they said that the Italians, we only vote liberals. Hmm. Tell me something. The last election, yeah, what did you vote? Uh, I voted for the liberals. Okay, what did you vote? Liberal. Everybody said liberal. Okay, guys, <laughs> so, so what exactly is offensive or discriminatory that the guy he determined that we all voted liberal? Yeah, but it's not the point. Like, then he says, you know, that we all have cousins in the, in the paysagist business. Uh -huh. My, your brother, he still owns the pepiniere. Yeah. So what are you complaining about? <laughs> and uh, we send our kids all to English school. Where does your kid go to school? He goes to OCC. That's an English school, right? <laughs> okay, look. So you, you have to understand, when the guy looks at the results, and, and just so you understand, before an election is the results are given, people already know the results. Mm -hmm. The political parties, forget what Angus says, what uh, Leger says, there's behind the scenes polling going on, they already know. And if you think that polling at 70, what's his approval rating, 75%, percent is like, oh, he's amazing, the best in the world, ah, look, oh, Trump didn't have a shot in hell to beat Hillary. Mm -hmm. He won. Yeah. He's got that clear. The polls were clear. Yeah. He was losing. 85% chance he was losing. Yeah, and he won. <laughs> and he won. He won. That's scary. Yeah. Then, his last election, he was getting, an, you have to remember this, we didn't know who he was mm -hmm. before he won the first time. Then we saw, ooh, a little weird, you know, like, ooh, you know, not too presidential sometimes on the behavior side. That's okay. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> right, you know, just, just. And then, he was going to get annihilated. Mm -hmm. Biden was going to like walk through the front door and like, pfft. and Trump got 5 million votes more than he did in the previous election. He did, yeah. So the polls are not always right. Yeah. But what we do know is this. Well, it's, it's, a, it's 155 million who voted for Trump. 80 million voted for him to lose and 75 million voted for him to win. That's right. But no one really voted for Biden to be the but president. That's, but you're right. Yeah. You're right. You know, and, it, and, it's, and that's where today... The next election, provincially, should not be about do I want Dominique Anglade, do I want Eric Duhem, do I want uh, uh, Gabriel Nadeau, or do I want, uh, uh, he has the longer name, Pierre uh, something, Saint Pierre. Uh, uh, he's a good guy. I know the uh, first guys. The guy from the PQ. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, it should be a referendum yeah. on. How badly did he fuck up running this thing? Right? It would surprise me if he won again, but I have a feeling he's going to win again. I just have this. Well, I can tell you this. The polls that get, so first of all, the polls that get announced, you know we're paying for them, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's government money. Yeah. It's our money. Okay, all right. The polls that are not getting announced, the ones that are negative, that he's paying for, mm -hmm. or, he, or the CAC's paying for them, right? And so, Parizo knew the day he lost that referendum, he knew that all of the wealthy French Canadian and English and Allophone families of Quebec did not support mm -hmm. the yes side. And he knew that, such as is the tradition, that the party that lets you into the country, in this case, the Liberal Party of Canada, mm -hmm. Immigrants will support you. Support you because you let them in. They'll support you till the end. Mm -hmm. So all he really said was, "We lost because they outnumbered us," and mm -hmm. that's what it is. Now that we want to be negative and say that that's racist, but <laughs> what I think is racist is when somebody says to me, "Hey, good zoo, sell your theaters and." Go uh, start a sauce company called Gattuso. <laughs> See, now you're a racist fuck. Yeah. See, the, and that's where ultimately we need to collectively be more critical, but also more forgiving. Mm -hmm. And not more forgiving and not critical at all. Because at the end of the day, right, it's one of those things mm -hmm. where 
we need to resolve this problem. Yeah. We, we, we can't continue like this. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Vince, if this continues, we know it's going to keep going till January 17th, this, unless they change something in the next couple of weeks. We know it's going till at least January 17th. Uh, kids won't be in school. Businesses will be closed. How much longer do you as a businessman, being a big business person here in Quebec and Canada, keep tolerating this? When is enough enough? When do you say, that's it? No, I've given up. I, I, I've already given up. That's why I'm screaming and yelling and hollering. But you haven't given up. You, you've given up in terms of the government and the way they've handled and mismanaged. You haven't given up in your love and, and pride no, you're right. your business. So if you're, and, and I'm not saying this, by the way, out of criticism, I'm just saying, if, if let's say you don't open up in defiance, which you've hinted a few times, you just might, right? But I get your point earlier in this interview, how you said you don't want to go down that road because it's us as a collective to do it and not just you, right? To go out there and go, I'm shutting down, then no one's coming because everyone's afraid of Omicron and Megatron and your theater is going to be empty with, right. with the screening of Spider-Man. So... How many more times is, because the way we're going, this is going to keep happening every winter, like you said. How many more times until you say, basta, as we say in Italian, enough, I'm going to sell, or I'm out of here, or what's next for you? So, I mean, how do you, at night, put your head on your pillow and sleep knowing this crazy government <laughs> is, is still doing this two years after the fact? So, you know, they say the last thing to die is hope. So I'm still hoping that something's going to happen and that this guy's going to like, I don't know, disappear. Just <laughs> get out of my face. Like, and, and bring along that almost your minister, didn't sound your minister of, no, and bring along your minister of culture with you too because she ain't brighter either. But, <laughs> so opening up and defines, I want everybody to realize that if I was a high school graduate, never went to university, never had a law degree, never any of that, I could reason and open up. But because I'm a lawyer, I'm held to a higher standard. You know the... And, and my fear is not, I want you to understand, my fear is not Lego. I, in fact, would tell you, I'm willing to sit across the table from Lego, and let's have a discussion. Mm-hmm. Tape it, copy it. You bring your facts, I'll bring you my facts. Let's see who wins. I have no problem. Like, like I'm not, like, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't. What bothers me is that we have in Quebec a, an issue. And the issue is we have a very awkward small claims court, which is very biased. Um, and so... The problem that would happen is if I open in defiance without crossing the T's and dotting the I's and making sure all of the legality of what I'm doing, I could see my insurance company cancel my civil responsibility liability coverage, mm -hmm. which means $10 million of civil you know, uh, uh, liability, which means that then every Tom, Dick, and Harry hater from... Twitter and Facebook, who wants to make a quick 10,000 bucks, comes and buy a ticket at my theater, claims he got COVID-19 at my theater, and, and screws me for the damages of yeah. $5,000. And now I got like 100,000 morons trying to collect, you know, $5,000 each. Yeah, it's a shitload of money for nothing. So you sit there and say, okay, it's not going to happen. That's mm -hmm. not probably where we're going to go. But where we are going to go is what is the minimum requirement for the declaration of a sanitary emergency as a decree. That's what I want to contest. Because I contest that. That's like taking that, you, you know, you've got that Jenga. I think it's called Jenga. That Jenga. Jenga, yeah. Jenga, that's right. The wood and, blocks. Yeah, and everybody's yeah. taking it. And you decide, because you're sick and tired of playing the game, you go grab the, the last one and you make everything fall. That's what contesting the sanitary emergency decree is. You're taking the last one and say, fuck this shit. This whole thing has to crumble. I'm sick and tired of it. It's gone. I, it's not my problem. And people need to understand, when I say it's not my problem, had the boomers that are today attacking me mm -hmm. on social media, 
Oh, you, you're all about popcorn salesman. You're a popcorn salesman. Oh. Guys, it's an old joke, man. It's so stale mm -hmm. that it's like not even funny anymore, right? If you guys had done your job 30 years ago and held le ministre de la Santé, Monsieur Legault, accountable 30 Bam, years Bam, ago, yeah. maybe you wouldn't be up Shit's Creek, all of us, mm -hmm. now. So do me the favor. If you want to retire and stay home, stay home. And if you believe that going to a movie theater is dangerous, don't go. But don't tell other people what to do. And that's where my problem is. My problem is if we told people, look, if you've got a condition and you've got this and you've got this and that, you're high, higher risk. Please don't go to the Bell Center. Don't go to, to a, a Rolling Stone concert. Don't go to Il Sonic during the summer. Okay? But no. Let's close everybody down. Let's all make all of us miserable and not the guy who's got the condition. Right? This is one of those awkward, and, and, and it's a very sensitive subject, so I'm going to slow it down. I had a call one day from a visually impaired person who said to me, I'd like to come to your theater, but I really can't come to your theater because you charge me to come and watch a movie even if I can't watch the movie. Okay? But you get a discounted price of $7 instead of 12 bucks, whatever it is. Right? See, I know, but at Cineplex, it's free for me and the person that accompanies me. Oh. Tell me something. You have a TV at home? Yeah. When you went to Best Buy to buy it, did, did Sony give you a freebie? Did Best Buy give you the TV for free? No, but that's different because me, the TV, I can't see it, so I bought it for somebody else that can mm. Okay? So listen to me. Why are you coming to the theater? Well, I want to, you know, I want to entertain myself. Okay, okay so, so, so you're getting something out of it, right? Mm -hmm. Even though you can't get the full experience, right? Right, okay. So that's why you're paying. <laughs> yeah, but at Cineplex, it's free. Okay, buddy. Do you know why at Cineplex it's free? Well, because they're nicer than you. No. Because one of the original founders or one of the original top ponchos of Orion, or Cineplex, then Orion, whatever, whatever in Quebec, was a, call, a guy called Jacques Martin. And he was clinically blind at the age of 30. Mm -hmm. And so he had a connection. But the truth of the matter is, people don't realize that we should not discriminate against minority. And we should do everything we can. But what's funny to me is, when to make my buildings to code, to respect wheelchairs, accessibility, this, that, 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 it adds 10, 15% to the cost of the construction of the building. I have no problem. Mm -hmm. But please, don't come and tell me that it's unfair and I should give you a discount. Mm -hmm. You cost me 10%, 15% more. So it's the same thing here. What do you mean? You have a medical condition, right? you are got that condition like one of those bubble boys that you have to be in a bubble protected. So because you have that, the whole world has to stop living and we have to close everything down because the bubble boy can't get, I can't kill the bubble boy. Hey buddy, it's, I didn't do this virus. It's not, I didn't call the purge and say, hey, let's do a virus called the purge. Mm -hmm. Like, let's So that's be, where we're at with, with this. Yeah, exactly. oh, you know, but, but, and that's where the truth of the matter is, they don't know, so, they don't know what to do by consequence, they just do whatever they think that time of the day makes sense for them. I've always said, Vince, it's like a, a dart, um, a dartboard, and they have post-it notes all over. And the government just puts up the post-it notes on the dartboard and just goes, tsk. <laughs> that's what we're going to do today. It feels like that's what they do. Like, there's no... No direction in this government or any so, like they don't come to us. I always say it's a game of they play a game of defense. So you're never in the war to win it. You're in the war not to get killed or not to lose, but we'll stand our ground. But they're not proactive in trying to get us to the next place, which is an open world. But and it, and it's not only our government; it's governments across the planet. But ours is the most backward and draconian, in my opinion, because. They offer absolutely no solutions, and here we are talking about it now for the last two hours, and it's frustrating, and everything you've said is, is fantastic, and it's brilliant, but 
will it change? Or will we be sitting here across from each other in three months or six months talking about the exact same thing? Because these people are still in charge and still making the same mistakes. I think if we don't go back to community leaders that have some true substance values, they may be totally against our views, right? Mm -hmm. But there's got to be a healthy debate. So, and, and, and I'll take you on a, on a very, very sensitive subject, which is oil, right? Anybody likes to shit on oil. It's, hey, it's shit on oil, okay? I have five kids. My oldest is 23, 21, 16, uh, 13, 11. So I got, you know, I got, and then I got my wife, officially 35. Right, I like that. Ah, say my my wife. I'm, nineteen forever. Nineteen forever, and so when I tell them, I say, "Why do you guys think glass bottles are better than paper bottles or plastic bottles?" So oh, there's no there's no petroleum, uh, less recycling. Why do you think there's no petroleum? So oh, the, there's no petroleum in uh, there's no petroleum in uh, in uh, in a glass, why right, to melt the glass and to actually make that glass to get to that intensity of heat, you think you get that with what? Electrical. Mm -hmm. You need gas. And tell me something else. You know the electrical dams there that we put up? How many insects and how many animals and how many trees and how many acres and acres and hundreds of thousands of acres you think we buried underwater? People lived there and we moved them out because they were native Indians. So, hey, move them out. Don't worry about it. We can. Like, I want you to realize, today, electrical energy is clean. But, but not when, back then. But when the infrastructure yeah. had to be built, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. no. When you look at the seats we're sitting on, leatherette, uh, 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 vegan leatherette, call it whatever you want, there's oil in there. <laughs> the foam made out of oil. And so you sit there and you go like, okay, but, 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 so what I'm saying is, even the claims, see, I, I want people to be more challenging. Why? Because as you challenge, you learn. As you learn, we get to know each other better. Mm -hmm. See, when I challenge the left on environment, I tell them, what, what do you mean at this rate we're going to be at this temperature? Yeah, yeah. How do you know that? Mm -hmm. Well, based on the extrapolation, oh, it's a forecast. It's a theory. Yeah, oh, okay. T t tell me something else. When you say this is the hottest the world has ever been, how many years are you monitoring temperature? Well, about 65 years. Okay, because you know that the world technically has at least 2,000... <laughs> 22 years now, uh -huh. plus whatever was before the coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. So we don't know. In other words, what, what I'm trying to make people realize is we don't know. Is it the gas? Is it the fumes? Is it that? We don't know what is creating the up and down. What I do know is this. The summers are really, really hot. But man, the winters are yeah, still. And so what happened to the, the, the it's getting hot uh, in the uh -huh. so, so what I'm trying to say is allow yourselves to be more honest and say, you know what? I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Uh -huh. Can you explain to me why? Yeah, in other words, can, can you tell me why a V12 car today is just as bad as a v8 mustang of 1974 because from what i understand there's not the same amount of gas being used and not the same amount of petroleum being used or fine and it goes mm -hmm. on goes on and then i said to somebody and i was in yeah, i was in calgary uh, alberta uh, during the not these elections the previous elections mm -hmm. when uh, andrew Scheer was running and i gave a speech at the uh, oil club and i i had had the the honor and the privilege, I got to say that, to have one of the Canadian billionaires from the oil fields bring me to the tar sands. 
and show me. And I was there, holy crap, it's impressive. Tell me something, I'm not getting what you guys are doing here. So we're extracting the oil that's mixed up with all this mud, we're doing this, this, that, that, that. Hmm. And then you sell the oil. Hmm. But why don't you just leave the oil there? Because no, it's, it's like, it spews up, like there's always more oil mm -hmm. coming out. Oh, you mean it's like a volcano on the ground? Yeah, yeah, it was exactly like that. So instead of spewing out lava, it's spewing out oil. Right, right. And if we don't extract the oil as it rises and it mixed with all this earth and everything, eventually it'll overflow and it'll go into our water streams and into the various... Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so it's like an environmental cleanup. The guy looked at me and goes, never saw it that way, but you're right. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so when some oil tanker drops a few billion liters of oil in the middle of the ocean, he's, it's okay for him to circle it, put it together, repump it out, and resell it. Pay a fine. Pay a fine, or whatever. And we can't protect our water sources or whatever. whatever. Well, maybe creating a bit of jobs or something. Yeah. And, and we can't do that. No. And send $13 billion to Quebec for... Uh, Equalization permits, yeah. uh, 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 payments, right? So, so I want people to say, wait up a minute. Why is it that people push back when it comes to cars? Mm -hmm. Because cars are a sign of freedom of mobility. Why is it that we don't close down borders? Because it's in communist totalitarian countries that we shut down borders. We don't want people going crazy. You know, like you got to understand why. But... My real problem is, why is it that you, government of Quebec, the guys who have the data, because they have the data, mm -hmm. I have the data, because it was leaked to me. Mm -hmm. It's like, so, so, so that we know, the Minister of Health leaked the information that we were going to have curfew, this, that, that, that. You already knew that. They were, right before Christmas. Mm -hmm. Leger, Leger is polling, calls up the PM's offices. Uh, wrong move, man. Population is going to kill you on this one. So he goes in, cancels the whole, whole thing. Let's re-poll. Numbers are higher now. Okay? Now, just so we understand, numbers are higher. Can we get PWC or somebody to audit those numbers, make sure that they're good numbers? Because, you know, one of the problems we have with the deaths is that when we add all of the deaths... And to try and scare people into obeying, we exaggerate the number of COVID deaths, wave one. Yeah. We have a problem because we can't take them off the books mm -hmm. for wave two, three, and four. So now we're screwed. Now we're the worst record. Yeah. Right? So that's where there comes a point where every scam eventually is revealed. It's revealed. It falls out. Yeah. Right? So I called my banker, for example, just to let you understand that every once in a while, you got to just <laughs> laugh and say, you know. So I called up one of my bankers during wave one. I said, hey, yeah, you should be able to lend me at least another 20, 30 million bucks. It's based on what? Well, on my assets. Yeah, I know, but what new assets did you add to the whole? What do you mean? Did you see the price of toilet paper, buddy? I got the jumbo <laughs> rolls, and you know how many cases I got of those things? My friend, I'm the richest guy in Quebec right now because of the value of toilet paper. Yeah. Right. So just to make everybody understand do you realize what we panicked? Think about this. We came to a point where we panicked, and the first thing we took from the grocery stores was toilet, toilet paper. paper. Yeah. Tell me something. What do you think would have happened if you didn't have any toilet paper? You go to the bathroom, do it, Jay. You got a sink there, you clean it. You know, like, like come on, man. It's not, <laughs> wouldn't you have stolen the water? Wouldn't you have, stolen, like, wouldn't you have bought yeah. food instead? Yeah. Right? But no, we went for the toilet paper, yeah. which goes to show you how unfocused we are and just the fact that we're not out of COVID yet. We, so, for those of you who don't realize it, when we have the flu vaccine, you know that the flu vaccine that we give in Canada in October, November, is the flu that was in Australia. Because th they're ahead of us. Mm -hmm. So they get it, we take it from there, we, we protect our guys. Mm -hmm. So they're the ones... There are guinea pigs. Let's put it out. That's the way. Okay. The, so now you're talking about the regular flu vaccine regular flu. prior to That's COVID. Right, the regular yeah. flu. So we know, we know what's going on around the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. The WHO has been very clear. 
you know, the who and whatever. Ah, okay. So, why, why did we talk about having a, a ministre du hockey? Why don't we talk about a tunnel? Why did we talk about, you know, f we have to continue protecting, you know, I said this on Radio X a few times. I said, guys, when you go to Italy and you watch a soccer game, it happens often that the guy says it's a corner. It's not a caccio d'angolo. He says corner. Mm -hmm. I don't see anybody freaking out. No. Say, no say, yeah, but it's different. You, you know, there's 56 million Italians. Yeah. How many Italians is there in all of Europe when you put them together? Still a minority mm -hmm. compared to the rest of us. What's the common language in all of Europe? English. Mm -hmm. I don't see anybody there dissing English because, and at the end of the day, shouldn't we be doing the opposite? Telling the rest of the country, hey guys, we want more French everywhere. We're going to get bilingual. And as for the Anglos, if they want to be bilingual, it's okay guys, you could be unilingual English, I don't care. Because you know what? It's the bilingual people that are richer. Mm -hmm. They have access to two cultures, mm -hmm. right? And very often, I have this debate with people when they say to me, yeah, but uh, you, you're not a supporter of Quebec films. What are you talking about? I played them all. There's not one Quebec movie I haven't played. Mm -hmm. If I didn't play it, it's because the distributor who owned the rights didn't want to give it to me, mm -hmm. okay? So it's, yeah, because you know, it's very important to have uh, movies about our culture. And just, she's very curious or something. Yeah, you know, there was a movie about a guy who was in a truck and he was suicidal. And the whole movie is about this guy. It's a Quebec movie. Mm -hmm. I said, what does that have to do with my culture? What do you mean? Or, or, or one of Xavier Delan's movies about, uh, about uh, some transsexual, gay, whatever, confused on a farm. Some, like, like, why, why are you like, what, what does that have to do with Quebec culture? So what do you think Quebec culture is? Well, I don't know about you, hockey, puts in, I don't know, uh, <laughs> You know, sex. I don't freaking know. I mean, I, 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 I sure as hell ain't. Things. No, I mean, I sure as hell isn't <laughs> suicidal truckers. I mean, it's not that we have an outnumber amount of suicidal truckers in yeah. Quebec, right? You know, so so yeah. what I'm trying to say is, we got to stop. Well, in, maybe now with this COVID. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> but we. No, actually, you know what? They're probably better off because they go to the states yeah. to come back and forth, so they're good. Yeah. But all that to say, what in Quebec, we need to stop spending money in the name of culture if it's not really for culture. Yep. In other words, it either helps promote my culture, it helps promote and make Quebec look good abroad. Mm -hmm. So, Denis Villeneuve, he had to learn how to speak English. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's why he made it big in LA. Yes, exactly. There we go. Yep. So now, why would I want to hold back my people, the people that I'm supposed to love, protect, and make prosperous by telling them, you guys could only learn French, okay? Because mm -hmm. we have to keep our Gaulois numbers tight. Why don't you do this? Do like the acidic community. <laughs> pay, <laughs> pay people to have 10 kids. Like, give me a bonus. I have five kids. Give me a bonus. I got yep. five kids. <laughs> right? So, and that's where ultimately, I think that, you know, in conclusion, if we can get to there, <laughs> COVID has, I think, put to light a lot of things. How bad our government institutions are run. Oh. Right? The number one place where cases were bursting out, schools. The number two, resident, personal residents, uh, no, uh, uh, retirement, retirement homes, homes. Uh, uh, hospitals. What the frig? I mean, everything that the government runs, that's where the problems are. So, so let, let's do like this. Let's let the government continue running everything, right? Let me sell my theaters to the government. Pay me a premium because, hey. Maybe that's what they want. But. That's, you know what? I'm more than happy. <laughs> I'll be there to buy them back at a discount. <laughs> like Petro-Canada. We paid a hefty dollar to create Petro-Canada. Mm -hmm. We gave it away for cheap. Mm -hmm. and, and, so, and, and that's where... I think we have to put aside, do I like Vince Guzzo or I don't? Or should I say, do I love Vince Guzzo or do I detest him? <laughs> Frank, not everybody has good taste. No. So not everybody could love me. What kind <laughs> of shit? You know what I mean? But no. But honestly, don't make this whole COVID thing about, 
It's because it's good, so saying it, that's why, fuck it, I'm going to go against it. Don't, don't do that, guys. You're only hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. Look at the thing, question the government, ask, account, ask for accountability. Yeah. I want you to realize that this government, every government, has asked you to be accountable by income tax. Yeah, exactly. It says, keep your record seven years. I got to be able to come back and audit you. Mm -hmm. Why can't you do the same? They work for us. That's we right. Don't work for them. That's what people seem to forget, and I have to keep reminding people that. Like that's what you know, because sometimes I'll get messages in my DMs. It's like Frank, all you do is criticize the government. Maybe you should run for office. And, I'm, and my line is always this: If I wanted to run for office, I would have already. And by the way, I'm not getting paid to do what they're getting paid to do, or what they were elected to do. They are paid to be prime minister and premier. They ran for office. They got elected. Do your job. Do you think, I mean, uh, uh, some people, you know, the, the people like the person who said that to you. Do you think my five kids enjoy reading? You, you're a fucking asshole, you're this, you're that, you're popcorn. I could, guys, once again, <laughs> I could sell everything. I'm in a as they say in Italian, and I leave. Get the hell out of here. Okay, and there's no problem. I'm surprised you haven't Because with it, the but, losses yeah. that I have accumulated with this, <laughs> I wouldn't even pay any deemed disposition taxes. Salut les boys. But you know what? I don't pretend to be the captain of the ship, but I ain't abandoning the ship because I was born here. I, I grew up here. My first girlfriend was French-Canadian. Mm -hmm. The first love of my life until i knew what the real love of my life was which is the one i am with now but uh, with french so so like we have to and let's be honest mm -hmm. as much as we want to criticize french canadians sometimes they're a good people of course they're an amazing people and in no country in the world have i seen immigrants so openly welcomed and been able to to thrive and succeed as in Quebec, but province, but <laughs> not but, <quite> country, <laughs> but man, man, can they can we be petty and envious and miss the point? So mm -hmm. all that to say, if I I'm bitching, it ain't because I want the theaters open. Mm. It's because I want everything open. Of course, I'm I'm saying the. Dumb and Dumber show, or for the French Canadians, the Ding and Dong show, it's got to end, man. It, it's, it's not possible. It's very easy to shut down a business when you're giving me $15,000 a month. Like, I want people to realize, you know, when, when my theaters are shut, my hydro bill goes from 140000 a month to twenty-five. Mm -hmm. It's not me saving. And by the way, hydroelectricity, you can't store it. Once the water passed through the dam, if I'm not consuming it, it's lost. Mm -hmm. So I don't care. But it's not right that my wife's suffering, my kids. Like, like We're all suffering. One of my kids is graduating yeah. this year, yep. and he won't have the decency to have a half normal graduation. Mm -hmm. Why? Because some guy, and I'm going to call him ding and dong because it's just funny, mm -hmm. but some guy is just not getting it. He's just not understanding that it's easier for him to say, Guys, honestly, I need help, man. I don't know what the hell I'm doing here. Like, yeah. I never thought, like, when somebody said to me, well, who would have thought uh, we were going to, but that's why. Mm -hmm. I just want you to realize, that's why I supported Aaron O'Toole and not Peter McKay. Because mm -hmm. I said to myself, I don't know, man, what's going on with this COVID thing? I'd rather have a guy who's seen combat, who's seen conflicts, and a state calm and collective mm -hmm. than some other guy who gets excited and, and like he goes crazy on me, right? And lastly, <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, you'll be able to come back at any other. No, no, wait, 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 point, because this is about way. COVID. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it, I am right, right? Dubai did say we're at war, right? Yeah. Yes. One, um, either he said it or Lego said it. No, but he I, said. It. Somebody said, and yeah, we're at war. Yes, because yeah. I remember tweeting about it. Yeah, so he said it, and just, just as a lesson to you, when mm -hmm. I say, sometimes when I ask these rhetorical questions, I think Dubé said, I don't think, I know. Yeah, it's just my way of pretending <laughs> I don't know everything. But, so, if we're at war, mm -hmm. as I said, if somebody would have gone to war, he would have seen the casualty of wars, and he would never have used the word, 
mm-hmm. war. But I remember... Oh, that's a, what I said, exactly. I remember a prime minister of England who was a drunk, who was this, who was that, who puffed a hell of a good cigar, though. Winston Churchill had to make a call. And the call was, do we let the Germans know we broke their code by evacuating a city of 5,000 people? Or do we let them annihilate the city and 5,000 people die? That's a hell of a call. Mm-hmm. Don't come and make me feel guilty that people are going to die because you fucked up your hospitals and you can't run them properly. Couldn't have so, said better. You know what I mean? Like, so let's not use war, debts. Uh, don't make me cry. Because when all this is over, then I have to, the guillotine has to come down yep. on, on somebody who's got to pay the bill. Yep. And it's usually the guys who screwed it up. Yep. So. Vince. Good, so thank you so much for being here, Mr. Sunshine. Not always a ray of light uh, recently because you're upset about what's been happening to <laughs> our country and province, but you still managed to keep things in perspective. And wow, this has been an incredible conversation that's gone on for two and a half hours. You can talk, man. Well, you look, <laughs> it's been a while. It's been a while, and, and it's okay because yep. I get to think and I get to analyze. Yes. But I enjoyed it. I enjoyed no, the conversation, I, and I invite you back anytime you want to come back to the Real Drive By podcast. You're invited here. There's so much more to talk about in the future, too, because I feel that this COVID conversation has taken over. Well, yeah, it's too, it's too negative. Well, not necessarily yeah. here, but it's taken over everything dialogue across the planet. You know, it always comes into everything movies, literature, music. We need to move on. So. Yeah, you know, you're right. In fact, uh, you know, on Dragon's Den this year, on, when we did film the season uh, 16, we, uh, we were told, do not make reference to COVID mm-hmm. every two second words because we're chopping it out. Yeah, we're yeah. editing it out. Like we'd like to go back to a season 16 of normality. And in fact, there was, except for a bathroom guy who's convinced that the, all, all diseases come from using the bathroom. Was that the pitch he was trying yeah, to? Yeah, he was trying yeah. to. It's the only guy who <laughs> brought up COVID. Episode. Nobody else brought COVID up, you know, type of thing. Uh, type of thing. So, yeah, no, we've got we've to move on. We've got to live with it. Um, and I think that we have to, uh, once again, I said, you know, challenge in a, in a respectful, non-destructive way. You know, maybe maybe we should all go watch the movie Gandhi again mm-hmm. and the realize movie. that civil disobedience, civil disobedience yeah. without destroying yeah. uh, uh, property. Property. Yeah. Vince Guzzo, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks for coming by here. Say hi to your lovely uh, wife Maria, who's I don't know who's been texting you there, but um, not my so wife, a whole bunch yeah. of people. Everybody, like, you're still speaking to Frank after all yeah. these hours. Yeah, she's probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah that's well, it's it's an easy conversation. So I thank you so much, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank with, you with, with your business, continued success on Dragons Den on CBC, and we'll see each other soon, Vince. Thank you. Thank you so much, buddy. Hey, it's Freeway Frank. Hope you enjoyed our podcast today with Mr. Sunshine, Vince Guzzo. Almost three hours. It was a long one. What We enjoyed having him here in the studio. And before we go, I wanted to thank our lead sponsor once again, Dormy Vu, for supporting the Drive-By Podcast. And I want to tell you about their New Year, New You event, which is happening right now. Get great deals on all your sleep essentials, including mattresses, bedding, and pillows. Speak to a Dormy Vu sleep expert today online or in-store and check them out. It's a brand new year 2022 and we are here to help you wake up to better sleep sleep well stay well at dorme vu thanks for watching this week's podcast see you again soon this is the drive-by with freeway frank